founder and managing director of Mothers of Special Heroes as they have introduced me. And I am so happy to meet other professionals who are involved in the care and um, education of people with special needs. I'll first by describing my organization. We are trying to assist, educate, and um, empower mothers of children with neurological disabilities. And we look at all types, um, for example, cerebral palsy, autism, spinal bifida, um, and many more. I'll go on to my topic, the vulnerability of uh, mothers, caregivers, and guardians of children with neurological disabilities and their special heroes. Um, we call them special heroes because they fight from day one. Uh, immediately you are told your child has a special need. Um, you both fight with your child and that's why I call them special heroes. And I'm also a mother of a special hero. And I'll start by uh, telling you my story, how I became a mother of a special hero. Um, at 10 months, my son fell into a bucket of water. I had left him with a maid. And after that, he had no head control. He could not talk. He, could, he was non-responsive. So he developed what we call cerebral palsy. And as a mother, that is not what you expect. You expect your child to go the normal route, development milestones. You don't expect them to, uh, to be uh, taken for physiotherapy and uh, speech therapy. So I just had to face it because it was now my story. Um, although my husband was always there for me and I would like to thank him for that because most men do desert their wives after they discover that their children have uh, disabilities but he was always there. But the reason why I called the organization Mothers of Special Heroes is because the mother is always there. Um, I'll also talk about the fight against stigma, especially in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I'll just refer to my own personal experience. At one stage, my son relied on his back for movement because he had no strength in his um, limbs, low, especially lower limbs, so he, 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 he relied on his back for movement. And uh, I remember at church, some colleagues would say, why is your child moving like a snake? And I, I, I didn't like it, but... I just had to accept it because that was my story. I keep on saying it's my story because it's something that I was not expecting, but it happened along the way. And then I lost some friends because, you know, every time when I was carrying my son, they, you would be um, trying to, to touch people, to get hold of people, to laugh. But then people didn't like the fact that he had some signs of disability and uh, he, was, he always had saliva, he, always, um, he was always crying. So I lost a lot of friends and they were saying, um, we don't want your son close to our children because uh, they will also be um, disabled at the end. So uh, that, uh, that was how I fought stigma at... Um, a personal level, I would just take my son to church, any other social gatherings. I didn't mind taking my son there because I felt he also needed a social life. So I made sure that wherever I go, I was with my son. I did not hide my son like most mothers would do. I made sure I took my son everywhere and he played with other kids in that state and um, up to today, my son is a very confident boy. Um, I will go to the next slide. According to statistics, uh, who 2020, about 15% of Zimbabwean's population live with uh, disabilities. And of, uh, of, of the 15% is 2,250 uh, million. According to the Ministry of Health and Child Care, there are only four government rehabilitation centers in the country, two in Arare and two in Bulawayo. 
most are privately owned and located in urban areas. So the reason why I had to highlight those statistics is because I was staying in a small town when this happened to my son, and then we had to move to a big city, to Bulawayo, so that my son could get um, rehabilitation, physiotherapy, and occupational therapy. So we had um, to go to Bulawayo, and I had faith that after, after my son received um, therapy he was going to be okay. Of course, looking at my son's situation after the accident, he could not walk, he could not sit, he could not talk, he could not move his limbs, he had no head control. I thought maybe my son was not going to even walk. Even the doctor said he was not even going to walk, but I'm pleased to say today, my son, Tajwo Naishe, is now in grade six, he can walk, he can talk. Of course, the, the, the speech is, is not so good, but I'm happy because I can communicate with my son. He can communicate with his siblings. He can go to school. He can use the toilet on his own. He's very independent. And up to today, I'm so grateful to, to everyone who supported me during that journey. It was not easy. And that's why in Zimbabwe, where I come from, I always tell um, the mothers of special heroes, we have about 400 mothers of special heroes in Blawayo only, uh, because we only started uh, Mosh in 2021. And um, of those mothers, I always encourage them, fight for your child. And if there are mothers of special heroes in this hall, please fight for your child. Because without fighting for them, no one will fight for them. I fought for Tajo Naishe, and uh, I'm happy today Tajo Naishe is growing up so well. Although uh, we can see that there are problems, there are challenges here and there, but at least we managed to get the maximum potential out of him. And when I'm talking of vulnerability of MCGs, MCGs are mothers, caregivers, and guardians. I mean, they are vulnerable in terms of emotions, in terms of physical, financial, and economic, societal, family, spiritual. So we are going to look at all of those forms of uh, vulnerability. Caregivers are usually stressed and frustrated. Imagine you are expecting your son to be walking at the age of two, and they are not walking. They are only using their back to walk. It's so frustrating. You get stressed, and you need to try and stay strong because even the society will be judging you, and um, you are always... Um, looked upon as someone who has done something wrong, as a result, your child has become disabled. Even as a mother, feeling helpless is also what is also um, tiresome. You also get to meet other people and they will be continuously asking you why your son is like that, why are they walking like that, why are they talking like that, and it's also tiring. We go on to the financial aspect. Having a child, a normal child, is very expensive. But having a special child is much, much more expensive. I think if you're a parent to a special child, you can agree with me that it's very expensive to have a special child because they need rehabilitation and sometimes they need diapers. Like my son used diapers up to the age of five, but now he's nine, he doesn't use diapers anymore. So it's, it's very expensive, the kind of food that they eat. Sometimes the doctor will tell you to give them soft foods. And then you also need a helper all the time. In fact, sometimes you have to stay at home because the helpers won't be that reliable. And then we look at the society. The society 
does not understand, especially in Zimbabwe. I don't know about other countries, but most people in Zimbabwe do not understand children with neurological disabilities. They can understand children who are deaf, children who can't walk, but uh, for children with CP, autism, etc., they kind of uh, think that um, it's as a result of um, rituals or um, uh, what, what, what do you call cultural backgrounds or um, it's because of witchcraft. So sometimes the parents are, are, are blamed of witchcraft when the child is autism. People do not understand the behavior of children with neurological disabilities. So in the society, you have to be explaining every time why your child is like that. And it's not a good thing to be explaining all the time. And um, the economic challenges that we have is we know in Africa, most countries are still developing and the economies are not so good. So it becomes very difficult for a mother with a special child to survive in such an economic environment, especially uh, with the um, current economic situation in Southern Africa. People are finding it difficult just to get food. So imagine you have to take your son for rehabilitation, you have to take your son for physiotherapy, you have to take your son to school, to a special school, and the special schools are very expensive. And like I said earlier on, there are very few rehabilitation centers in Zimbabwe. Um, I'll go on to the next slide, mental health. It's not easy to have a child with uh, disabilities. You might be depressed, frustrated, and sometimes you might feel that, why am I the one who has such a child when everyone else has a normal child? And that could also actually cause a lot of mental problems to you. We find, um, at Mosh, we do find some mothers calling me at 10, 12 midnight, telling me that, Chantel, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this child. I can't even go to work because of this child. I can't relate well with my siblings because of this child. So it actually causes mental problems to have a special child and you need a support system in place so that you don't break down. So as Mosh, we are trying to support uh, mothers with um, children who have special needs. In terms of diapers, we do give them diapers every month. We also make sure that their children are doing art and music as a way of empowering the special heroes. We also have uh, products that we are making and they do sell them as a way of financially empowering them. And then we go on to stigma. Stigma happens at individual level, family level, societal level, and national level. When we talk of individual level, we are looking at um, the caregiver themselves. Sometimes it's not the mother of a special hero who is looking after the special hero, but it could be the grandmother, maybe the mother has um, died or they've ran away from their special child. We have cases, so many cases of teenage mothers running away from their uh, special heroes because maybe they, they are not prepared to face what has happened to their children. Uh, most people do call me a hero because it's not easy to take your story and uh, get uh, some, orange, some lemonade out of the lemon that you have. I just had to make sure I change my career after what happened to my son. I had done a degree in marketing, but I had to change and do development studies because I wanted to understand my child. So um, it also helped me that I deal with the stigma at an at, at individual level. You hate yourself, you blame yourself. Like, for instance, for my own personal story, I had to blame myself why I decided to go to work when I had a 10-month-old baby in the house. I was now beating myself, why did I even go to work and leave my baby? But um, uh, I just had to accept what had happened and uh, I understood that it could have happened even if I was there. 
And then we also have uh, mothers skipping rehabilitation le lessons because they feel they are not going to help their children. They also feel uh, their children do not have a future. I talk to most of um, our beneficiaries, our mothers of special heroes, and they are always saying, do you think my son is going to be like Tashu Naishe? Do you think my son is also going to uh, go to school? Are they going to be able to talk? They are so hopeless. So that stigma at individual, at individual level and sometimes they do abuse their children because they feel the children are a hindrance to their progress in life. They also leave uh, the children in the care of secondary carers like sisters, siblings or, ho or housemates and that results in sometimes abuse of the special hero. And then we go on to the next uh, level of stigma, which is um, the next slide, please, which is societal level. Um, in Zimbabwe, the society is not offering that um, support that is needed by a special mother so that they can raise their children because we get shaming, public uh, shaming, laughing, and sometimes we are called a witch because they believe no, you, you can't be giving birth to a child with disabilities. Obviously, there's something that we have done. And you know, with our culture, people always go and visit um, prophets and um, uh, witch doctors, and they'll be asking why the child is like that. And obviously, the answers won't be, they won't get those answers like go, 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 go with your child to physiotherapy, go and get rehabilitation. They will be told that someone is bewitching the baby or you are the one who is supposed to bring a god and so on. So because of our societal beliefs, it's so easy for, uh, it's so difficult for the society to accept the mothers or the children with disabilities. Um, an availability of disability responsive services like transportation and buildings. Most buildings in, um, in our country or maybe in Africa still do not have those um, like ramps which make, makes it easier for people with wheelchairs to move around the buildings. So the unavailability also means that the society has not really accepted the fact that there are people with disabilities because we are supposed to be having those everywhere. Wherever they, there are people, there should be those people because we have these people everywhere, wherever we are. And then we go on to stigma at national level. Uh, here we are looking at imp uh, implementation of policies or even introduction of policies uh, in countries like in Zimbabwe. We are trying to push for policies that will also uh, make it easier for mothers of special heroes to look after their children, like mo uh, most probably getting uh, grants so that they can be able to look after their children. We are also pushing for more rehabilitation uh, centers so that the mothers are not, um, are not uh, lazy or they, they do not um, feel like it's expensive to take their children to rehabilitation centers. So we have been pushing for the government to um, accommodate everyone and provide free rehabilitation services. They are very limited accessible facilities countrywide and we are also pushing that they actually give us more facilities and schools which accommodate uh, children with cerebral palsy, children with uh, uh, autism, ETC. And then um, we are also looking at the rural areas and in 2024 Moshi is looking at expanding into all provinces and um, rural areas so that we can actually uh, make sure that we reach to each and every special hero in the country. Then we go to Moshi activities and milestones. I would also like to highlight that um, Moshi is only two years old but we have been able to do those activities and milestones without funding. Um, we have educational workshops that we conduct with the local government hospitals. 
We also have uh, CBD workshops with people who want to understand what's happening uh, in terms of uh, disabilities. We also do random home visits to our mothers of special heroes. We carry some groceries and we go and talk to them. We understand them. We understand where they are coming from. We see what's lacking there so that we can be able to help them. We have also been able to do vulnerability assessments, see how they are vulnerable and see how best we can assist them. We have been able to do a research and development um, we have a research and development department which has helped us to reach out to about 800 beneficiaries in just one city, which is Bulawayo. And then we have also managed to start sustainable and live, live, livelihoods projects, which we are going to showcase at our store. We do have peanut butter, mosh peanut butter that we give our special mothers to sell. We also look for other products like sweets and biscuits so that they can sell and vegetable produce. We also teach them catering and um, crafts making. And then we do have support groups in all areas, in all suburbs, be it high or low density suburbs. We are also involved in awareness campaigns. This, year, this past year we had um, a match, a very successful match around the CBD, telling the whole city that it's not a case to have a child with disabilities. It's just a matter of you having such a child one day. It's something that can happen to anyone. It's not a case. It's not a disease. It's just a condition. They are just different, but they are not less. We also have, we also managed to do a. Um, a, a, um, an exhibition expo where we uh, we invited physiotherapists and other stakeholders involved in the life of a special hero and they came and, and the parents were asking and they were going around the stores and getting inf more information on how they can look after their special heroes. We also do medical and funeral um, insurance cover for our special hero, although it's something that is pending because of funds, we also provide assistive tools and devices like wheelchairs. Uh, we've also been able to engage with uh, public hospitals to identify target groups because um, it's not easy to just find target groups in the, uh, in the society that we live in because some of them are still in denial and you can't just go to them and say, I want to assist you since you've got a child with special needs. So we had to work with public hospitals to identify our target groups we also educate MCGs on handling, on how to handle their children, and we offer sanitary pads and disposable nappies for our special heroes. We have um, monthly group birthdays for our special heroes. We do understand that some of them might not be able to do birthdays. They are only able to look for food and basic things that they can offer their special heroes. So we do monthly group birthdays. If we have special heroes born in December, we do a group birthday and we celebrate. And people think that uh, they, these special heroes do not know anything. They do know they are, spe they are special, but they are also intelligent. So we also have informal, informal uh, group support groups in, in Blawai. Um, can we go to the last slide uh, because of time? Uh, I'm looking at uh, the vision 2025, where we are looking at opening a health park in Zimbabwe. If I could uh, get um, partners and sponsors, I would love to open a um, health park which has got a rehabilitation center, a respite center, a clinic, a farmer's amusement park, where the special heroes can also come and enjoy, just like any other children, educational facility and the supermarket. And I hope by 2025, when I come for an ICANN um, Autism Connect, um, uh, what do we call it, um, meet conference, I'll be able to tell you that we have managed to open the health park. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to introduce to you Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Temple Grandin is an American academician, an animal behaviorist, and an internationally renowned spokesperson for autism spectrum disorder. Grandin is one of the first autistic people to document the insights she gained from her personal experience of autism. She is a currently a faculty member of Animal Sciences in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University. Based on her experience, Grandin advocates early intervention to address autism and supports a teacher and professional who can redirect the children with autism right in fruitful directions. She has been an outspoken proponent of autism rights and neurodiversity movements. In 2010, Temple Grandin was listed as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time 100, which named her in the heroes category. In 2011, she received a double helix medal and has received many honorary degrees from many universities, including McGill University, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Carnegie Mellon University. Grandin has been featured on major media programs. She was the subject of the Emmy and Golden Globe winning bi biographical film Temple Grandin. In 2018, Grandin as a feature in documentary This uh, Business of Autism, which explores autism employment and the success story of autism employers. She has been uh, written up in Time magazine, People magazine, Discover magazine, Forbes, and the New York Times. She is best known for designing the Hug Machine, which is a deep oppression gadget planet to calm extremely sensitive people, ordinary people with autism. Temple Grandin, thank you. Hi, I'm Temple Grandin. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. In fact, I've been at Colorado State University for a long time and I have autism. I had no speech until age four and I was very, very lucky to get into some very, very good early education. I cannot emphasize how important it is to get little two-year-olds and three-year-olds who are not talking into therapy. And if therapy is not available, then you get grandmothers to work with the child. Get grandmothers that know how to engage that child. Teach them how to take turns at little games. Let's say the kid's lining up blocks. Then have the child uh, uh, take turns with you lining up the blocks. Also, you want to teach speech. I want to give you a hint slow down when you talk to these kids. Slow down and give the child time to respond. These kids are like a phone with bad service. You have to wait for it to download the web page. That's how these kids are. So I want to work on speech, turn taking at games, and then skills. Things like washing your hands, brushing your teeth, putting a shirt on, basic skills. And if you're getting good progress, the kids should like going to therapy. The child should enjoy therapy. And if therapy is not enjoyed, then you're pushing them into sensory overload. But I cannot emphasize this enough. You have little two and three-year-olds that are not talking. You must start working with them now. Absolutely now. Now, my very first slide shows a picture of me teaching my class. I'm a college professor. And there's been a lot of issues about identity recently. And my identity is my career. I'm now 76 years old. I've, um, I'm, I've taken my speaking engagement money and paid to put um, graduate students to um, the university. I have three that are now professors, very proud of them. And so becoming a you know, successful university professor and designer of equipment has really made my life worthwhile. The next slide talks about brain variability. Autism is a, is a continuous trait. You can go from slightly awkward and nerdy to somebody who's nonverbal, it may have severe epilepsy and mobility issues. It's a very big spectrum. And a brain can either be sort of more cognitive and thinking, or a brain can be more social, emotional. And in the mildest, mildest forms, it's a personality variant. 
The other thing I want to warn you about diagnosis is over the years, doctors have changed the diagnosis. Back in the 1980s, to get an autism diagnosis, a child had to have a definite speech delay. And then in the early 90s, you get the Asperger's where it was uh, autism, no speech delay. And then in 2013, they merged it all together. And that's uh, really made diagnosis difficult. But if you have a child that's not speaking, you need to be working with them. And if they don't gain speech, then what you need to do is give them a way to communicate. And one of the simplest things you can do is have them just type on a tablet using the text messaging program. There's lots of old tablets around. And that can be used as a communication device or a picture board where they can point to things or sign language. But if you can't get the child to talk you know, quickly, then you've got to give them a way to communicate because not being able to communicate is so frustrating. I could remember screaming when I couldn't tell my mother I didn't want to wear a hat. Uh, it was the, the most frustrating thing. Now, the, in the family histories of people who are autistic, you often have a lot more scientists than computer people. And then if you have um, bipolar, then you have more people in the arts. Now, a lot of famous people probably were autistic. Thomas Edison is shown on the next slide. He probably was autistic. And on my next slide, Einstein is shown. He had no speech until age three. He would be in an autism program today. And he was one of the most brilliant mathematical geniuses of, of, of all time. Now, the next slide shows a picture of a launch pad. I am a real NASA geek. I really love this outer space. I wanted to go into, astro into aeronautics, but I couldn't do the math. I, but I love outer space. I got to visit this launch pad. Really, really cool. And... There were a number of people working at NASA on things like building a launch pad and uh, uh, build, designing control rooms. They're autistic or dyslexic. When I was building equipment out in the plants, um, I worked with people that owned big metal working shops that were probably autistic or dyslexic. I, they were the kids that were bad at math, but they could build anything. Now, the next slide talks about emotions being different. I have emotions, but the things I get emotional about is really cool stuff, like getting to go to Cape Kennedy and watching a SpaceX launch. That was just the coolest thing. And then looking at live video feeds of some astronauts, you know, going up to the space station, those really cool spacesuits. That's the kind of stuff that gets me turned on. And a lot of uh, fully verbal individuals with autism don't have many friends. I'll tell you how to get friends. Friends who shared interests. You get together with the people that like horses, or you get together with people who want to train dogs, or you get together and have a chess club, or you go into robotics club, or uh, you're in the in music, doing music together. Uh, friends who shared interests. I was bullied and teased in school, and the only places I was not bullied and teased was friends who shared interests. And for me, it was model rockets, electronics, circuit boards, and horses. Those were places where I had friends. For somebody else, it was something different. Now, I got very emotional. The next slide shows a picture of Saturn. We can skip over that. And then the next slide shows a little Voyager satellite. This satellite is really, really getting old. But there's an ancient old scientist. He's in his 80s named Ed Stone. He is still communicating with it. Yeah, still communicating with it. I get emotional about that. Ed Stone is communicating with this ancient satellite. I think it's 40 years old now. And it's his life. You see, I can relate to that because it's just something so cool. The next slide shows the ultimate NASA geek out. I got to sit at the um, at the head controller's station, the mission control for the old space program. It's a picture of me there. Now, the next slide I talk about, just don't get hung up on the labels. Too often. Where, so I'm seeing kids where you're getting too much into the label. They say, well, the kid's got a label. He's not going to be able to do anything. I've heard this over and over and over again. He's not going to be able to do anything. Even with some of the kids that have physical handicaps. They'll say, well, he can't walk. They'll never go to school. They'll never get a job. But I worked with a lot of autistic people that owned businesses. This is, this is what really frustrates me. So don't get hung up on the labels. Okay, we have a three-year-old that's not talking. Let's work on getting them talking. And we also have to get them out doing things. Don't just hide the kid at home. Take them out shopping. 
and turn shopping into a learning experience. Well, let's talk about different kinds of rice. I know in India, there's all different kinds of rice, curry sauces and things like that. Um, and and uh, uh, let's uh, let him pick out some of the things. Or you can say, well, dad likes this food. Uh, go get it off the shelf. Turn it into kind of a turn-taking game. Get them interacting, getting them the help with um, chores of the house. Um, now, I have grandparents on, on the next slide. Uh, grandparents come up to me all the time, and they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. And they would be the milder type, probably with no speech delay. And where that diagnosis really helped that adult is it helped them with their relationships. That's where it really, really helped them. Because then they, I had a lady come up to me uh, uh, at um, in the airport. She said to me, well, that my book, Thinking and Pictures, helped her understand her engineer husband. It was my book, Thinking and Pictures, my old autobiography, Thinking and Pictures. She now understood her engineer husband, who um, now that she had found out that uh, about autism. You know, these kind of things are coming up all the time. But I'm seeing too many kids today ending up playing video games all day, and they're not doing anything else. They're not working in the video game industry. And I don't recommend the video game industry because a lot of that work is going to get replaced by artificial intelligence. I'll tell you the work that's not going to get replaced. Kinds of stuff that I did. Uh, fixing motorcycles. That's not going to get replaced. AI is not going to do that. Hands-on jobs. A nurse. Uh, somebody who's a very good motorcycle mechanic, that's not going to get replaced by AI. And since I've been traveling really heavy now, I'm seeing lots of elevators that need fixing. And AI is not going to fix elevators, and elevators are not going to go away. So I'm going to tend to really emphasize the hands-on jobs, because those are the jobs that AI will not take out. It's going to take out some programming jobs. Now, the next slide shows me standing in front of the vehicle assembly building. And I got really, really, really emotional because that's the most fantastic thing that us old folks did was go to the moon. And the next slide shows pictures inside the vehicle assembly building. And I got on the roof and I found out later on I wasn't supposed to be on the roof. But that was just so much fun. So much fun. OK, the next slide talks about some sort of foundation principles in working with these kids. Sudden surprises scare. OK, so let's say, for example, a child has to go to a new school or you're going to go visit some, some new friends. Uh, maybe you show some pictures of their house. You show some pictures of the school. So it's not such a surprise. OK, let's say they're going to travel on an airplane. Well, let's let's look at videos of airplanes. Maybe go to the airport, and watch them take off. Uh, you want to reduce the surprise factor. The other thing you need to do is stretch these kids. We don't force them into something where they're going to get into sensory overload, but stretch them and then give them some choices. Well, we could do this game or that game. We could go to this store or that store. You give them some choices and we've got to limit the amount of time they're spending just tuning out on phones and other electronics. Now, don't recommend it banning. Don't want to ban it. But what we need to be doing an hour a day is plenty. The next slide shows just a picture of a really, really good teacher. And a good teacher knows how to kind of gently engage a child without causing sensory overload. The next slide just emphasizes the importance of turn-taking in a game. And if you were to use a game that's on a phone, I want one phone physically passed back and forth. Physically pass the phone back and forth. So it's a true interaction. Now, the next slide talks about teachable moments. This is a 1950s way of parenting. And I think it's a really good way of parenting. If I made a mistake, you know, we had sit down meals, you had to eat properly. And uh, if I stuck my finger in the, in the mashed potatoes, uh, mother did not scream, no. She would say, use the fork, okay? Or if you're chopsticks or whatever, you use them. You use the utensils. She'd give the instruction instead of saying no. That's really important. Just quietly give the instruction. Now, obviously, if the child ran in the street, you'd have to, you know, but I'm talking about things like maybe touching uh, too much stuff in a store. You might say, only touch the things that you're going to buy. You give the instruction quietly. Okay, the next slide just talks about limiting video games. One of the things we've got to avoid 
is these kids just becoming reclusives in their room. But then on the other hand, do the problems with sensory. And sensory problems are real. Some of these kids need some time just to calm down, just some time to chill. And that is okay. But some of the recent research going on with the social media use, again, I don't want to ban this stuff. Um, some kids play a video game where they can talk to friends. That I don't want to take away from them. But they can't be doing this for 10 hours a day. That's something that we just cannot be doing. The next slide talks about just providing some choices. So you might say, well, you could do robotics or you could do soccer or you could be in the theater group or you could be in the school band. You could do karate. Um, Cub Scouts is an American program for kids where they learn camping and other skills. So we're going to get out and we're going to do things, but you give them some choices. Now, the next slide shows a little child blocking his ears. Sensory problems are real. That's part of autism. And, and one of the ways to help a child that's afraid of something that's really, really noisy is to let them control it. Hair dryers, vacuum cleaners. Let your child, let the child turn that thing on and off where they control it. And I've talked to several families where the vacuum cleaner went from those hated fear thing to the favorite toy when the kid could control it. Same thing with car horns. Let the child beep it. Um, now, if you if some kids wear ear protectors all the time to block out sound. If you wear those all the time, sound sensitivity will get worse. That is something you do not want to do. But to give you control, you can have those headphones with you all the time. Have them with you. They can be around your neck. They can be on the top of your head. Have them with you. And then you only wear them when you get in a really noisy place like the train station. Okay, so something really noisy like that, you wear the headphones. But the rest of the time, you have them off. But you have them with you. You see, this control is so important. And then another thing we have to be looking at is problems with flickering on LED lights. Some LED lights flicker. I just found out one of my students who's not autistic, but sensitive, that our beautiful new lecture hall has lights that flicker. Uh, in new construction, let's try to not build that. Let me tell you how you can find them. Take this thing out here, right here, put it on slow motion video and take pictures of the room and you'll find the bad lights. So what do you do if you have a classroom with awful lights, which unfortunately I just found out that our beautiful new classroom has awful lights. Well, there's two things you can do. Put the uh, desk over by the window or go find an LED that does not flicker. Put it in a lamp that the child could bring to school and put next to the desk and wear a hat with a brim. That will also help block out the ceiling lights. So I just wanna try to give you simple, simple stuff that you can go. Now you can skip over the slide here about the headphones. We already talked about that. The next slide talks about sensory perception and autism. And these sensory sensitivities are part of the neurobiology of autism. And they're very variable. Like I do not have visual sensitivities. I teach classes in this classroom. I didn't see it flicker. You see, this is where, where autism is so variable. One individual or adult will have problems with lights flickering. Also, you can get it in some dyslexics, not all of them. Also, some head injuries, too, can also uh, uh, give problems with lights flickering. But sensory problems go with it. Now, the next slide talks about just checking for deafness. Um, auditory threshold's normal. But there's a problem with auditory detail. It's very important when you're teaching these kids speech, slow down when you talk to them. Because when the parents talked fast, blah, 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 just went a blabber. You got to slow down when you talk to them. Give the child time to respond. They're like a phone with a bad connection. Give them time to respond. And, and uh, even though the threshold for hearing a faint sound, if you know, let's just give an example. If I said the word dog. Uh, maybe the child just hears, oh. So when my speech teacher worked with me, they'd go dog, and then they'd go dog, really slowing down and enunciating the sounds. Now, there's three basic ways that speech can have problems. 
I had problems with hearing auditory detail. That's an auditory processing problem. Then I had problems with getting my speech out, almost like a stutter. But now the next slide just show, talks about echolalic kids. Echolalic kids are the ones that will recite TV show and movie scripts, things that they've listened to over and over and over again. But the problem is they don't know what the, the, the speech means. They don't know what it means. So what you have to do is, um, is, is find some lines from that movie that you can put in a real situation. I was just up in Canada and a teacher told me that this little boy sung on yellow school bus, uh, something he'd heard, yellow school bus. And I said, that's an easy one. When you go out to the school bus, which happens to be yellow, you say yellow school bus, that line from the, the script, just as you're going up to the yellow school bus. And you've taken that out of that out of the script of some you know kids program thing that they've played over and over again. And then it tends to be something they've played over and over again that they pick up these lines from. The next uh, thing I talk about is attention shifting slowness. You see, if you're a phone with only one bar of service or a computer with a very small processor, it's hard for me to multitask. It's hard for me to switch attention back and forth. This is why multitasking jobs can be so difficult like a busy, busy takeout window or very busy restaurant where they just have to dish out a lot of orders all at once. That would be a problem. The next slide shows uh, it's an old study done by Ami Klin with some of the very early uh, eye tracking software. And they watched a movie called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, an old black and white movie. But look at how many times the normal person looked back and forth between the eyes. There's nothing in this paper about attention shift. It's all about social. The normal person looked at the eyes, but I looked at this, the autistic trying to read lips in the mouth and look at how many times the so-called normal person has shifted attention compared to the autistic. This is the best picture I have gotten this ancient old paper on attention shift. Now, the next slide just shows a little, uh, a little uh, a thing that I did on a childhood assignment when I was five years old that I was so frustrated and I was supposed to mark the uh, pictures that began with the letter B. B is in beautiful. I knew my alphabet and I marked a suitcase as a B for bag. And they didn't give me time to explain it. In my family, we called them bags. And it was so frustrating because I understood the B concept. The next slide shows how some people that have visual processing problems can actually have images break up. And this is a slide from a, 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 some of the people with migraines also have some of the similar things. The next slide just shows some video interference that might be kind of give you an idea of what the individual very severe visual processing problems might have. And if you're working with nonverbals, there's some really good books like Tito Makapadehe, he's from India. How can I talk if my lips don't move? Um, it's a great book. And he describes problems with sensory scrambling, visual scrambling and problems with motion. The next slide shows an escalator. And children with visual processing problems or adults with visual processing problems often hate escalators. Another thing that they'll complain about is the print jiggling on the page when they read. The next slide just shows that. It shows the, the um, print jiggling on the page. Now I wanna make it very clear. This does not explain all dyslexia. It only explains some dyslexia. Okay, the next slide shows some simple things that you can use. Try printing the homework on different pale colored papers. Now, this is one of my children's projects book, Calling All Minds. And look at how it gets some nice light blue there. Like try printing the homework on a real pale, light colored paper. Try maybe pale green, pale tan, pale uh, lavender, uh, pale purple. I'm, I've seen this really work experiment with different fonts on the computer, experiment with different backgrounds, and and that may work. It only works on a subgroup. And then I already talked about using the light to block out some of the bad lights. Um, the next slide just talks about very severe sensory problems, extreme efforts required to screen out background noise. For example, if I'm in a noisy restaurant, very hard for me to hear. And I also have problems with fast chit chat conversations. They just go too fast 
for me to follow them. The next slide is the title of a paper called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. That's the title of a paper. And what's done in this is you might hold a, okay, a warm cup and then smell maybe a cinnamon. Okay, so you're stimulating two senses at the same time with a lot of emphasis on touch and smell. Or you might listen to music and hold a cold water glass. You know, very simple things. And what you're doing is always changing those things. Uh, and it, it has some efficacy. It's actually a, a you know, evidence-based uh, method as an adjunct. It doesn't replace speech therapy or something like that. Next slide are some of the really best books written by individuals who do not speak, but they have a good brain inside there. And uh, my favorite is the one from India, Tito Makarapadehe, How Can I Talk My Lips Don't Move? It's my absolute favorite. Uh, it's available on Amazon as an ebook. These are all available on Amazon in ebook format, which makes it easy for you to get. Um, and if you're working with a child that does not learn to speak, these books, you must read these books. You know, they're, they're wonderful books and you'll really understand. The next slide just shows some brains. And the thing is, is when you hear a word, you see a word, think about it, different parts of the brain turn on. Now, where we've got a problem in the brain is lots of times with the interdepartmental communication between these different parts. The next slide just shows, the next two slides just show some really cool brain scans that were done on me of uh, the interconnecting circuits. And then we can go down to one that says axon projection field much less organized. One of those uh, is mine. And the other one is a, is a so-called normal one. And this explains why I had problems with expressive speech. I had less fibers for speak what I see. The next slide just circles the less fibers. And then on auditory, I got just a little tiny one. I'm not auditory. The thing I can't emphasize enough, it's showing in the next slide, there's a three-dimensional drawing drawn by an autistic child, develop the kid's strengths. And this is something I really emphasize in my one of my newer books, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. Work on the strengths. So how do you figure out what a kid's strengths are? Well, visual thinkers like me like to build things, and we like to do drawing. Art and mechanics, those two things go together. You might have another kid who's mathematical. Then move that kid ahead in math. Or another kid that loves verbal facts. These are history lovers. Uh, it move them ahead in the thing that they're good at. Uh, the next slide just talks about my ability in art was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different art because a lot of these kids just want to do the same anime character over and over and over again. And people get bored with that. No, we need to be broadening it out. I would draw a horse head. Let's draw the whole horse. Now, the next slide just shows how I see movies in my head. Everything I think about is a picture where the mathematical find things in patterns. I think in pictures. Also, really pay attention to detail. I've got a picture there of eclipse shadows through a tree. And being a visual thinker, somebody who really thinks in pictures, this was really an asset for me in animal behavior because I looked at what the animals were looking at. That's what I did. Other people couldn't they think in words. They couldn't understand, why would I want to look at what cattle were looking at? That, that's kind of ridiculous, but it's important. Next slide just shows seeing a car through the fence, uh, picking up little details in the environment. Uh, animals are live in a sensory-based world. They don't live in a word-based world. They live in a sensory-based world. Next slide just talks about some um, uh, things that have been learned about autism on auditory capacity, uh, much really good uh, pitch discrimination, uh, hearing unexpected sounds. The next slide just shows a curved cattle handling facility. Being a visual thinker really helped me in my work. It was really, really good. Uh, the next slide shows how they recreated one of my projects for the HBO movie. And one thing about the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, that is available from the streaming services, it shows how I think visually. It is absolutely accurate on how I think visually. Next slide just shows starting my career in construction and design, and mentors are important. My mother, my, my speech teacher, my third grade teacher, 
I had a great science teacher who um, encouraged me and got me interested in studying. And then there was a a, a man named Jim Ool who uh, who saw my skills and mentored me in getting my business started. And the next slide just shows one of my drawings. One of the things I learned is when you're weird, when you go for an interview, I would just show off my drawings. I would just show off my work. Here's some right here that I like it will show off on Zoom. I would simply show my work, show the portfolio, rather than just you know trying to do the interview. The next slide just talks about showing the uh, portfolio. I would show off the work. Or if a child was, or if somebody's really good at a lot of computer stuff, they might show off a computer they built or show off some programming they did. Sell the work rather than yourself. The next slide just shows big complicated uh, piece of equipment. Yes, I worked with people that had autism that built these things. This is what gets me very frustrated as I go back and forth between the educational world and the autism world and the industrial world. We have a big issue right now with skill loss. We don't have anybody to fix the elevators. They're in the basement playing video games on an autism diagnosis. Next slide just shows uh, some people looking at it and just mentioned that uh, there was a lot of autistic people that I worked with at own shops. But one of the mistakes that's been made in a lot of countries is taking the hands-on classes out. And I discussed this in my book on visual thinking. It's one of the things I discussed in my book, Visual Thinking. I discussed, you know, the skill loss we've got on taking those hands-on classes out because that person that's super good at fixing that elevator may not um, um, be very good at algebra and math. I still never passed an algebra class. Now, I didn't know that I thought visually until I was uh, in my late 30s. And I'm, and I'm going to show you how I found out. I realized my this is one of the slides. I realized my thinking was different when I asked people to think about church steeple. Okay, why did I pick that out? Because it's something prominent in the environment that you don't own. Most people could see their own car or maybe see their own house. If I ask them about it. So I say, uh, think about a church steeple. How does it come into your mind? Now, visual thinkers like me see them come up as individual pictures and name off where they're located. Where somebody that is very, very verbal may just see two lines. This was a shock to me. They might just see two lines like that. That's all they see. And then um, these flash into my mind like Google for Images. I've got a whole bunch of slides here showing off individual churches. Um, and then you've got different types. You've got great big cathedrals. You've got small. I can then, as I see more of them, I can sort them into like chapels versus cathedrals. And then I get into some slides that show that I have a huge visual thinking circuit in my brain. Huge. Um, that's why I'm a visual thinker. Okay, then in other countries, instead of uh, steeples, you can just use mosques. Same thing. You know, it's out there in the environment. You can see the minarets. They're different. I've looked at them. They're different. Be the same thing. Um, but it's not something that, pay, that most people pay attention to the same way they would their own. They'll think about a house. Then you might see your own house. That's why I don't ask house. So I got two slides there showing my big visual thinking circus. Then I got a slide where it shows like working memory is pretty well shot. This brings up another accommodation that can save a lot of jobs. And that says, use a pilot's checklist. The slide that says that. I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. You know, let's say it's something simple like cleaning the ice cream machine at McDonald's. Well, I need a checklist for the take apart steps, just like a pilot checklist. Cleaning steps, one, two, three. Reassemble, put it back together steps. Because if they just go yak, 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 I can't remember. I have a terrible working memory and I need an external working memory. And there's many, many jobs where using a pilot's checklist format would save a lot of jobs. Just let them write down the steps and you can look pilots checklists up online and on the big for a big airliner you might have a hundred items on the checklist they don't throw a hundred items at the pilot it's chunk pre-taxi pre-takeoff it's put into different parts of the flight that'd be similar to the take the ice cream machine apart then clean it then put it back together 
But there's a lot of situations where using pilots checklists would save a lot of jobs because employers will go, oh, I want to show them how to do that. Is he stupid? Well, this is where I need that external working memory. The next slide is a super important slide on the different kinds of minds, which is a major theme in my book, Visual Thinking. And the correct name for my kind of mind is an object visualizer, because everything I think about is a picture. And the kinds of stuff that we're good at, art and mechanics, because you can see how things work. Art and mechanics, also photography. But that's what we're doing, good at horrible at abstract math. I worked with people that owned shops that were designing and patenting all kinds of equipment that couldn't do algebra. You see, this is where the hands-on mechanical genius, it's a different kind of mind. Then you have your visual spatial. This is your pattern thinker. This is your mathematician. This person thinks in patterns, patterns, not pictures. They're gonna be your chemists, programmers, physicists, things like this, things with math. And then you have the person who's a verbal fact thinker. They think almost completely in words. And if it's an autistic person, they often love history. They often love facts about maybe maybe uh, sports, different sports and things like this. They'll know all of the words for the, all the different players and things like that. So let's look at the jobs for these different kinds of minds. My kind of mind, mechanical stuff, fixing stuff, inventing mechanical stuff, photography and art, mathematicians, computer programming, um, electrical engineering, the more mathematical parts of engineering. Because one of the things I've found in working with um, these big uh, food companies is that the shop people, the people like me, invent mechanical equipment. The more mathematical mind has to make the refrigeration systems in a food processing plant work and make the boilers work. That stuff requires more math. So you need the mathematician mind to do engineering, but you also need my kind of mind who can't do algebra to work on the mechanical things. And then what the verbal thinkers, good jobs for them, specialized retail. There's been some really good successes in selling cars, selling specialized business insurance, selling sporting goods, where they're recognized for their knowledge of the products, you know, selling phones and not try to sell somebody the most expensive phone but sell them the phone that's right for them. I'm, I'm, because where we're really falling down is on the job front, getting them into jobs. Let's start off with chores for little kids, 11-year-olds, maybe helping out at a fruit stand or you know a, some little market stall, uh, uh, doing a, a job at a community center, walking dogs for people. I want them doing something on a schedule outside the home really important because the moms often tend to overprotect is that they're legal age they need to get a real job and you need to just figure it out in the neighborhood this is a, one thing i've noticed when i've gone to a lot of countries there's a lot of little tiny small shops and i drive by those shops and i'm going oh that little clothing store would be perfect for this autistic girl to start doing some work in and you just set it up in the neighborhood mother did that with me when i was 13 she got me a little sewing job with a local seamstress who worked out of her home. It was just something done in the neighborhood. But they've got to start learning how to do things outside the home. And um, this is really, really important. So we start making that transition to work before they graduate from high school. I cannot emphasize this enough because work skills are not the same skills as academic skills. Now, I was a goof around student until my science teacher motivated me to study because being a scientist you had to study and I made up for about three years of high school where I goofed off really quickly but I'm seeing too many kids where they're not learning how to drive they're just not learning any skills okay when I was eight years old the next slide talks about use a variety of teaching methods when I was eight years old I couldn't read mother taught me with phonics I already knew my alphabet and she would read out loud find a book that I was interested in. We had a book in, in the U.S. called The Wizard of Oz, a really fun book. And she'd stop in an interesting place and then have me uh, read read more and more. Uh, and I very quickly learned to read in phonics. It wasn't that hard. There's all kinds of complicated stuff online. Oh, who didn't use any of that stuff? I already knew my alphabet. And I already knew the little alphabet song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, yeah, the little song. And that has half the sounds. 
and I was able to um, I, uh, learn how to read. And I very quickly went from, uh, I was eight years old, no reading. I immediately went up to the 12 year old level of reading uh, very quickly. This next slide just shows um, uh, like this kind of two ways that mathematicians kind of do things. You have the one that's all totally algebra then the ones that are more geometric. The next slide just says if you use a Google image search and you put mathematical terms in, you can find so many great stuff. Then I've got a slide of a of a plant that has mathematics in it. Then I've got another slide that shows Penrose tiling. That's what Stephen Hawking used. And I really, really like um, what Stephen Hawking had to say about disability. Concentrate on those things. Your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. He could do math in his head super well. Next slide just uh, talks about getting interesting magazines and things in the school library, fractals. I've got a whole bunch of slides here that just show cool, interesting stuff. And um, then I'm, there's a picture of me with a horse looking at me sawing a board and friends who shared interests. A lot of kids aren't doing enough hands-on things. AI is not going to take away hands-on jobs. You're still going to have to have a nurse in the hospital. That's not going to go away. Um, there's a lot of jobs like that um, and jobs fixing things, uh, mechanical devices. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things that 3D printers can do, but guess what? Somebody has to fix the 3D printer because it's a mechanical device controlled by a computer. And the next slide just shows, a oh, some kids today, they don't know how to use a ruler. They don't know how to put a hose on a faucet. Um, the next slide just shows a beautiful rainbow. So when I think about really abstract stuff, like, okay, religion, I kind of look at that rainbow, it's so beautiful. I also have a picture behind me of the deepest space field from the Hubble telescope, and it's got thousands of galaxies out there. And you know what's interesting about that? The scientist who did that pointed the Hubble at nothing, and he found all the galaxies. Uh, let's talk about the next slide about bottom-up thinking. Okay, verbal thinking will get a top-down concept. Like maybe, let's have it. <clears throat> have a uh, inclusive classroom, for example. Um, all right, that's a good thing to have. I wanna see autistic kids mainstream into a regular classroom, but how do we do it? Bottom up, I think in specifics. Okay, the LED lighting issue and the flickering. Bullying, bullying has gotta be gotten under control. Those are, some, those are two things we have to do. Using the pilot's checklists would be another thing. You see, those are specific things that you could do to make a classroom more inclusive. The next picture just shows uh, autistic kids sorting different things in his mind. And my mind's like a spreadsheet. So when I was a little kid, um, I, I said, cats are smaller than dogs. But then when our neighbors got a little tiny dachshund, she was the same size as a cat. So I had to find other features that she shared with dogs, like barking, the dog smell, and the shape of the nose. Now, the bullies used to call me tape recorder, and I got a picture of a 1960s antique tape recorder there. And I didn't know why they were calling me that, because I'd always use the same phrases. But then as I got out and I did more and more things, then I got less and less and less like a tape recorder. Okay, teaching number concepts and generalization. Okay, count a variety of different things. Teach fractions, maybe cut up on, you know, cookie into four pieces. Teach fractions to teach concepts like up and down. Uh, if you go down the stairs, the plane went down and landed. I put this cup down. And you wanna show several different examples because if down was only related to the stairs, I think it only applied to stairs. So I've gotta give different things where um, I use the concept of down. And then the brain pictures there just show that that um, looking at, um, uh, things is more interesting than people. Yep. I get really turned on about things like the scientist who had the guts to point the Hubble at nothing and he found everything. The other scientist thought it was stupid to waste the expensive observing time on looking at nothing. Single most important picture that telescope took. Okay, the next slide is just more stuff on friends who shared interests. We've already discussed that. And the next thing on 1950s upbringing this is where there were some things, social things, at least in the U.S., were taught in a much more structured way in the 50s. Turn taking at games, being on time. That was drilled into me. And I find, I think, we had a big, huge school clock that was this big. 
And every time the minute hand, the second hand went around, the minute hand did one click. I could see it. I think, an old, and you can get these electronic ones, battery operated versions of these clocks. They still exist. Help with time. And then sometimes you got to do an activity you don't really like because somebody else in the family wants to do it. That gets back to turn taking. The other thing that really helped me, and it helped a lot of kids in the 50s, is party hosts and hostesses. In the 50s, when we were seven and eight years old, we had to dress up in our good clothes and we had to like uh, pass the snacks around, greet the guests, be little hosts at the parties. And my brother's not autistic. He hated those parties. But he admitted they helped him become a bank vice president. Because I just read in the Wall Street Journal just the other day that college students are just scared to death to go up and talk face to face. Uh, those parties were important and they're an easy thing to do and they don't cost anything. And then just being cute to say please and thank you. Basic, basic play. What I'm going to call just being play. You cannot be a rude, filthy, dirty slob. Okay, there's a lot of concern now about masking and yeah, there's some hypersocial stuff I can't do. You can be eccentric. I dress kind of eccentric, but you cannot be a rude, filthy, dirty slob. And there's a scene in the movie where my boss slammed down a deodorant and said, you stink, use it. Yeah. Hi, Jane. Yes, you're going to have to clean that one up. Just that simple. The other thing that's really important, shown on the next slide, is how parents and the teachers need to work together as a team, where the rules are the same at home and school. And my mother and the local teacher kept really uh, in close contact with each other. The next slide talks about teaching social skills. It's like teaching somebody how to behave in a foreign country. Like, for example, in the Middle East, if I were to lift up my foot right now, a, a hand up, not my foot, I won't actually do something that's rude in the Middle East, put my foot up and show it to the screen, that would be the rudest thing I could do. Now, normally I wouldn't do that anyway, but there'd be other situations where I might just accidentally do that. I have no way of knowing that's rude unless somebody tells me. Well, that's sort of how teaching everything in, it is. Teaching shaking hands, ordering. I'm seeing kids that have never ordered food in restaurants. That's ridiculous. Shopping. 16-year-olds doing well in school and they've never gone shopping by themselves. This is ridiculous. The next slide, I got to visit the Jet Propulsion Lab. Those are the guys that run Mission Control. Eccentric's fine. Red hair is fine, dyed hair is fine, filthy, dirty slobs are not okay. Now, the other thing just shows some of the NASA work, work stuff. And when the space shuttle got canceled, the scientists cried. It was the saddest thing you ever saw. Anger doesn't cut it at work. People who throw tools get fired at NASA. Now, I'm trying to get through all of this to be, stay within the hour. I think I'll be able to do it. I've, now, rules. Which rules do I really have to obey? Now, I have to obey, you don't do really bad things. You know, like just break into stores and steal stuff, destroy property, kill people. These are things that in most societies you just don't do. Then you have the courtesy rules. They're different in different cultures. Saying please and thank you, for example. Then you have illegal but not bad. Um, those are some rules you can break. Uh, a little bit of speeding is okay. Too much speeding, absolutely not. And then you have rules. I call them the sins of the system. These are getting so sensitive right now, I just about won't even mention them, but they're things that can get you in more trouble than the really bad things that are forbidden in every society. I mean, just wrecking property, killing people, uh, stealing stuff. That's stuff that in every society, but these are things where uh, I was just going to say, this list is expanded, and the penalties are really, really severe. And you don't touch these dogs. They bite. They bite hard. Don't touch them. And they're getting so controversial, I don't even want to mention them. Okay, teaching values. Uh, teach the golden rule one specific example at a time. Treat others the way you want to be treated. So I'm thinking about the two wallets I, I got helped get returned at the airport. That's not Mother Teresa, but it's something good. Those people are very happy to get their wallets back. That's treating others the way you want to be treated. Also, the TV shows I watched in the 50s had much better values. Oh, see the rubbish that's on TV now today. We'll just leave it at that. Now, another big problem that I had, <coughs> and i got to have time to talk about that, is problems with anxiety. And a lot of these anxiety is biological. The next picture shows my squeezing machine. And the squeezing machine, deep pressure helped calm me down. 
And for some individuals on the spectrum, deep pressure <coughs> is really common. I found out that my fear center was bigger than normal. The next slide. And I used to be terrified of public speaking and terrified of airplanes. And one of the ways I got over being terrified of airplanes was getting to ride in the cockpit and making aviation interesting. Take the thing they're scared of and make it interesting. Things get interesting. They tend to be less scary. But I have been taking antidepressant medication for the last uh, 40 years. I'm on an old, uh, an old, um, uh, an old drug. Okay, it's fully explained in my old book. And, and you know what? The meds haven't changed. The generic meds for the same stuff we had 25 years ago. And <laughs> so thinking in pictures is still accurate. We just did some revisions just like a couple of years ago on it. And if you're thinking about, especially for a teenager or adult taking medication, I'd recommend reading a chapter that I call a believer in biochemistry. But a big mistake made with antidepressants is too high a dose, way too high a dose. Start her dose or less. Because if you go too high a dose, you get agitation and insomnia. No, the medication saved me. Uh, colitis and other very bad stress-related health problems cleared up. I, no, I, they really helped me. That there's way too many drugs given out to little kids. Way too many powerful drugs given out to little kids. You know, you can I've taken an old-fashioned antidepressant, Prozac or fluoxetine or sertraline that's so loft or Celexa, some of these other drugs also work well. The next slides just show a, a rear view of my squeeze machine and how um, you can do cushions for doing deep pressure on children. There's another slide there showing swinging a child. And sometimes when you swing a child or when a child rides a horse, they say their first words because of the rhythm. Another slide just shows a weighted vest. You know, these are things you can try. Uh, they, see, they don't work for everybody. See, this is the problem. Work for some, and not for others. But if you work on kind of desensitizing to touch, that can be really, really helpful. You see, I could control the squeeze machine. Let's get back to this whole thing of control. Exercise. A lot of kids aren't getting enough exercise. I got a slide in there saying I do 100 sit-ups every night. I hate every one of them. Burst of hard exercise really can be helpful. Really helpful. Then my elementary school life skills training, we talked about the party hostess. Another thing is I did is I sold candy for charity and I was shopping by myself for little, sna uh, little toys. I got a little allowance and I'd buy comic books with that. But if I wanted this little toy airplane, I had to save for two weeks. I was learning how to save money when I was seven and eight years old. The next slide just shows my work experience. I had a lot of work experience before I graduated from uh, college. This is really important. I cleaned a lot of horse stalls. I, I had a little sign painting business. And I had to learn how to make a sign that somebody else is going to want. And my first, um, first uh, sign was for a hair salon. So I put the um, shampoo lady on it from a brand of shampoo. The next slide shows an ugly shed that I made look nice. You see, I had to do work that other people would want. And the next slide shows me painting a goofy sign for the for the Arizona State Fair. You know how I got that job? I showed off photographs of my signs. And the next slide shows my sign painting truck. And, uh, and I, how did I learn to drive? This is a major hurdle. It's going to take longer. You have to spend more time practicing in a really safe place, like a big stadium parking lot, a big open field where there's nothing to hit, absolutely nothing to hit. And you practice and you practice like 20 minutes a day, maybe for a couple of months, maybe for two months, until you no longer have to think about how to use push the gas, how to work the gear shift. You've got to get that operation of the car into what's called motor memory before you do traffic. Go so at it a lot more slowly. And then um, I just have a slide there, tasks outside the home. Um, a whole bunch of tasks there I that might be different in different countries. But the bottom line is I want them doing a task on a schedule outside the home. And this needs to start like at 11 years old. In the U.S., that replaces paper routes, which we don't have anymore. Next slide just shows, um, oh, Lego mind storms might be one activity. 
Then I've got a slide in there that people were impressed with my drawings. Um, that's uh, that's really important. I then I've got a bunch of slides here that show uh, selling myself rather than uh, uh, you know you know selling showing off my work. I got a whole bunch of slides on showing off work. Talk about showing kids interesting things. Um, the other thing on getting jobs is we need to be getting in the back door. And there's a picture in there that shows the Swift plant where I first started. And I met uh, the wife of the plant manager. Yeah, you see, use connections. And then there's my, um, I was wearing this shirt that's in the Cowgirl Hall, Hall of Fame when I met them. You know, using, you know, connections to get into jobs, finding mentors. I know I'm running out of time here. Got to just rush through this. Uh, finding mentors. My mother, my elementary school teacher. These are so, so important. And then I have a bunch of slides here that show jobs for the different kinds of thinkers. I don't think I need to read all of that to you. You can look at those. And then to finish up, I've got some stuff on medication in here. Let's try exercise before you try a drug. You know, it's like, don't get, one of the big things that's a problem is way too many drugs are handed out like candy. That is wrong. And the medication that I'm, I'm on, I am on, the antidepressant, is you know relatively mild medication. The other thing is try one thing at a time. So let's say you try a supplement, like a gluten and casein-free diet, for example, that helps some kids. Try one thing at a time. If you do a new school and a drug at the same time, you don't know what worked. This is just a basic, basic thing. And, and no medication is going to give you 100% um, control of anything. Okay, now in troubleshooting behavior problems, you got to figure out, is the problem biology? Because you might have a nonverbal person that doesn't speak, and they got a stomachache, and they can't tell you about it. That's going to make a lot of behavior problems. That's biology. Or maybe there's certain loud sounds bothering. Or uh, that's biological. Now, behavioral, uh, sometimes you do things to get attention. The whole frustration with not being able to communicate is huge, but I have kind of a little troubleshooting list there of um, things to try to, especially with nonverbal clients. Then I have a list of painful things that can be wrong with a person who is um, who is nonverbal. Uh, I, there's been horrible cases where people have died from a burst appendix. They were nonverbal and they couldn't tell the doctors that they were hurting. Uh, and there's a whole list of things that can be painful things. There's some books that it might be helpful. Okay, some of the supplements, uh, probiotics. I take probiotics. They've helped me prevent urinary tract infections. They've worked. But I'm not taking, I'm taking one probiotic. I'm taking one regular medication, dicipramine, an old-fashioned tricyclic antidepressant, and I take one probiotic. I'm not taking pharmacies full of stuff. You know, let's try to figure out the stuff that works. I then have a list of the antidepressants. And in low doses, the things that they're good at is anxiety. I don't know about depression, but they work for anxiety. Low doses. And then you've got the atypicals. That's the heavy, much heavier drugs and much more side effects. Things like obesity, for example, can be a side effect and some uh, shaking a disorder. And... You know, you want to try to use the lowest dose that will work. Sometimes very, very tiny doses of Respiridol help with sensory, but I mean tiny doses. Uh, another uh, low dose principle, use the lowest dose that works. Um, and then for some of the problems with uh, anxiety, sometimes blood pressure pills work. And I've got a slide there that has blood pressure meds on it. And then uh, epilepsy drugs. You can sometimes get outbursts that are actually psychomotor epilepsies and they're completely random completely random uh, they can be calm listening to music and have a, an attack and you treat it with epilepsy drugs yeah, and, and uh, so that's kind of getting near the end of this look up interactions I, I, I'm, I'm finding that you know let's say you're taking four different medications make sure they don't interact with each other and you can look that stuff online. It's readily available. But there's a tendency sometimes to just uh, 
okay, we got one little problem. We just throw another drug at it. That's wrong. But on the other hand, I'm not anti-drug because I think this medication has saved me that I'm on. And I write about it in this book. And even though it's 27 years old, it's still accurate because the generic stuff's still the same. Um, and I'm taking a probiotic that that prevents urinary tract infections that the doctors could figure out how to stop my urinary tract infections. Now I just take it. They gave me antibiotics to clear it up. And then what the probiotic does is it prevents it. And that's worked for me. Now something may, but that's two things. That's not shelf full of stuff. Well, I think we've run out of time. I had an hour and uh, it's been wonderful uh, talking to you by video. I think we've covered a lot of stuff and it's been great to be here by video. And I want to thank the hosts there for staying on and letting me talk to you because I do a much better talk when I got people there I can see and talk to. Okay, thank you. You're going to hear from three mothers who are having autistic children and very good professional doctors, two of them. Um, so maybe I can start as a parent. Uh, and I, I know most of us parents here would be wondering, uh, especially parents from uh, Africa. So we're wondering, what are the more advanced uh, interventional therapies you know, across the world? Because in Africa and in Tanzania, to be more particular, we're already used to the normal basic therapies. So we would like to know from you doctors, what are the more advanced uh, you know, intervention therapies out there? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, I think you, you want to know about the rehabilitation therapies. Exactly. So as we know that the pillar stone or the, the basic uh, uh, conventional treatment for autism is neuro rehabilitation and uh, that's the foundation on which the whole treatment for autism uh, or cerebral palsy or intellectual disability basically leans on. So uh, of course all of you know about occupational therapy and speech therapy and, and some we also do physiotherapy as well as special education uh, and ABA therapy. So these are, these are very important important and have been tried and tested for many, many years now. But what we also uh, have, especially in India now, we have aquatic therapy. So aquatic therapy is uh, ther children love water, right? So basically if you make them like swim in water or do specific therapies in water, they calm down better and it helps them concentrate better, their coordination improves. So coordination is one of the major issues in, in children with autism. So aquatic therapy has has a big role to play in uh, a comprehensive part as being part of a comprehensive treatment for autism. Apart from, the, apart from that, of course, sensory integration therapy. We are aware of sensory integration therapy as a part of occupational therapy, but it's a science in itself because uh, the information processing is a problem in children with autism. So sensory integration therapy, then art-based therapies, animal therapy, I think it's, it's a beautiful therapy. Children are very sensitive and the animals are so sensitive like we have trained dogs and horses are a very good medium with, who sense the children's um, uh, despair or, or their moods very well and help them settle down and, and they work together beautifully. So animal-based therapy uh, has come up uh, as a part of, as, as one of the treatments for autism. So what we believe uh, in India and in Neurogen is that uh, it's important to do teamwork. So everyone working separately, you will achieve a little bit. But when you work as a team, to, together everyone achieves more. So comprehensive, holistic rehabilitation, which happens together under one roof, would be the ideal situation to get treatment for, for children. And especially parents understand the importance because they are going from one place to another to another to get rehabilitation from different uh, people trying to you know squeeze in everything in one day. So, 
comprehensive holistic rehabilitation under one roof, roof which combines conventional rehabilitation with advanced rehabilitation treatments like aquatic therapy and sensory integration therapy along with ABA and speech and special education and art-based therapy and, and uh, animal therapy would be the best combination, we believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nandi. That was very well answered. But to answer your question, what is required, as Dr. Nandi said, is comprehensive rehab. In autism, the children require occupational therapy, speech therapy, behavioral therapy, psychological therapy, special education, art therapy, aquatic therapy. They require a combination. What happens in most parts of the world, you will have an occupational therapist who will only give occupational therapy. Then you have a speech therapist who will only give speech therapy. And they don't work in isolation. What we've realized over the last 15 years of working in this field is you need a combination. So there is a need for centers where all of this can be provided together. Honorable Mr. Mulil was asking what we can do from a district level. What is required is facilities where all these therapies are available in one place. Also, when we are looking at this, we should not look at urban areas only. We have to think of the rural areas as well. And in India, what we have found is one of the best ways to work on this is to train, train the local village workers, local workers. They may not be professional rehabilitation uh, therapists, but they will provide the basic care that is needed. So a structured rehabilitation program, which has all the specialities, is the need of the art. And the important thing in this is this does not require infrastructure or money. Okay, this requires <laughs> trained therapists. And we, from our side, we offer, and I'm making this open offer, any therapist from Tanzania, Kenya, or Uganda wanting to train in these rehabilitation therapies, we offer free education and training to all of you. So if all of you, if, and we have regularly been doing it, over the last 15 years, people from all across the world have come, and we offer this completely free of cost. You're welcome to come to us. We will train you, because rehabilitation is human-based. It's about people. It's about training. And we are able to offer that. So any, any of you therapists here, should you ever wish to come, please contact us, and we will arrange your entire training program uh, to uh, Honorable Minister Mulel. If you, as a government, if you send people, in any case, Tanzania and India have a wonderful relationship. Historically also, many people from Africa have actually trained in India. You know, from the administration of civil services, military, we have a very good education, and we want to continue with that. And uh, we will offer training, comprehensive, very good training, uh, at no cost at all. So this way, we can improve the basic infrastructure of uh, this thing. And we are also willing to conduct training programs here. We've already conducted several training programs. We've conducted in Kenya, very huge one-week programs, where our people, so in case it's not possible for people to come, we come and train, again, at no cost at all. From the actual, actual practical training, we give literature, books, lectures, and make it a very comprehensive program. So that, I think, will be part of our Tanzanian-Indian partnership as we go ahead. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Sharma. I think, one, I like uh, the assurance that you can train, your institute Absolutely. can train our therapists. I think that's very positive for us as parents and as professionals. Thanks for that. And I'll ask Madam Kate uh, to go. Yeah. Um, me, as a parent, I already know like what are the autism physical uh, symptoms. Like my son would run around the whole time, like flapping uh, hands or having repetitive behaviors, playing with kids and all that. Do we really know what is happening in that child's brain? Is there any way you can tell us how can we know what is happening in this child's brain? It's. it's uh really important because so many parents come to us and say oh my child looks absolutely fine 
So what exactly is wrong? You know, people say that there is something wrong in the brain, but how do we know? The MRI, most times MRI is not done, and even if it's done, it seems, it, the structure seems to be fine. So at Neurogen, we went ahead and actually looked at really what is wrong in the brain, and um, this was done through functional imaging. So uh, uh, advanced scan imaging known as a PET CT scan of the brain, which tells us about functioning of the brain. So structure-wise, everything seems to be fine. But when we look at, at the PET scan images, we find that there are certain areas of the brain which are functioning less. And that is indicated by, uh, which is very easy to read, uh, made it easy to read through a color spectrum. So uh, uh, we, uh, we were explaining uh, to the Honorable uh, Deputy Health Minister also that you know, when you look at the brain with, with those uh, different color schemes, you see that there are green, uh, uh, lighter brain, green, yellow, and red, which are normal functioning brain, but deeper parts, which when we say out and we, we think of, about what do they do, it correlates beautifully. So the small part of the brain, and one of the speakers uh, yesterday actually mentioned that the cerebellum, the back of the brain, which is important for coordination, balance, articulation, chewing, uh, integration of functions and movements and tone is working less. And you can see that in the PET scan. The deeper parts of the brain, known as the medial temporal, which is uh, responsible for understanding, learning, comprehension, socialization, emotional expression, the, this is working. And the middle part of the brain, which connects the two brain, known as thalamus, which is a relay center, is working less. So all of this is possible uh, only through the PET scan. So through the PET scan, we can actually find out which parts of the brain are working less. And now we get an understanding as to why our children are unable to process information or unable to respond to a lot of uh, training that we do. So advanced imaging has really helped us go deep into a better understanding of, of, of what is autism and what really is, is uh, uh, functioning less and what is lacking in the children. So to continue with what she said, uh, there is new brain imaging technology. And here I, keep, I will have to keep talking back to Honorable Minister Mulel that we will need this equipment in this country. Uh, this is equipment called PET CT scan. Uh, I'm not sure if it's available. It may be available. Uh, uh, this is modern functional imaging, which actually tells us uh, which parts of the brain in children with autism are not working. So if it's there, that's great. We can actually start, uh, you know, uh, uh, investigating and looking at our children. But what is functionally, as Dr. Nani said, has been found? So if I were to divide our brain into an upper brain or a higher brain, which does the thinking, the intelligence, the executive function and all of that, and then there is a little lower brain, the smaller brain called the cerebellum and the medial temporal brain. This is responsible for the primitive instincts. This is responsible for, uh, you know, the basic uh, reflexes that we have. Now, what we have found in our research, and we were the first to do this uh, in the world, and we've published our work in a very prestigious journal called the Journal of, the World Journal of Nuclear Medicine. We have for the first time shown the world that there are parts of the brain that are what is called hypermetabolic or not working properly. And this corresponds to the symptoms. So now for the first time we know why our children cannot talk, why they cannot read and write, why do they have all the behavioral issues, why can't they make eye, eye contact, why can't they, you know, take care of their daily activities like, you know, brushing, bathing, food, etc. Uh, why, why can't they process information and comprehend? Because there is a part of the brain there that's not functional. For example, let's say if you, any of you, developed a fracture of your leg, would you be able to run? Would you be able to walk? You would not be able to stand. It's not your fault. It's just that if your leg is fractured, you can't walk, run, and, you know, uh, move around. But if your fracture was fixed, now you'd be able to walk. Now, this also answers a question that many parents have. Many of you will say, we have done all the rehabilitation possible and still our child is not improving. Okay, are there parents who will say that? There are parents who will say that, right? That we have done all the rehabilitation possible, our child is not improving because presently we are doing rehabilitation on brain that is not functional so much. But now there are medical technologies that can actually help improve this function. So understanding is the first step towards getting a solution. And today with the brain, the understanding comes from modern imaging techniques 
which include PET CT scan, MRI, EEG. MRI and EEG is available easily. But a combination of this gives us an insight. And once you have an insight into the problem, now you can find solutions. Thank you so much. I think uh, that's wonderful. I have a question as you yeah. speak. Huh? So there is this brain, you've done your imaging, you've mm. done the PET scan, your phone, there's something in the brain. I've heard there are new uh, treatment modalities, hyperbaric oxygen, therapy, ozone. What is the role of those uh, treatments in either treating or allevi allevi uh, alleviating the symptoms of this brain? So what brain imaging has shown us is there are parts of the brain of these children which have what is called hypoxic ischemic damage. That means this brain is not receiving enough oxygen. Now, if the brain is not receiving enough oxygen, then obviously one possible solution is to give it oxygen. But just giving normal oxygen does not help. What we have found and what medical science has found is you have to give oxygen under pressure. So right now, we are breathing oxygen at one atmospheric pressure, all of us, okay? And when you breathe oxygen at one atmospheric pressure, only the red blood cells in your body carry the oxygen. In our blood, we have got red blood cells, white blood cells, and a liquid called plasma. Right now, all of us are breathing, only our red blood cells can carry oxygen. The liquid of the blood has no oxygen. But when you give oxygen under pressure, like two atmospheric pressure now the oxygen goes into the liquid okay so right now in our body only our red cells are carrying the oxygen when you give it under pressure the entire blood is carrying oxygen so much more oxygen reaches deeper parts of the brain it goes to every part which may be possibly hypoxic so there is this uh, new technology called hyperbaric oxygen therapy this is available, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's available in Dar es Salaam, but I'm sure it's available. It's normally used for wound healing. Uh, you know, so far, hyperbaric oxygen has been used for wound healing. But what we have found is when we use it for oxygen, uh, when we use it for autism, sorry, there are significant improvements, especially when we combine it with many other treatments. Uh, so there are a lot of scientific publications that actually show the benefit of this. All this requires is a hyperbaric oxygen machine. It's not very expensive, and it is very, very simple to maintain. Most government hospitals, med medical colleges do have hyperbaric oxygen. The only thing is they use it for adults. We have ev evolved a protocol for children, and we have, uh, we have successfully used it in several thousand patients. So we have this unique protocol where children with autism can be helped as well. Thanks. And is there, uh, I'm asking as a parent, I know it's given in a chamber and sophisticated, yeah. you know, environment. Is there a provision for a home-based uh, um, hyperbaric oxygen? Yeah, so you do get home-based. Uh, the oxygen therapy we use, they are called heart chambers, okay. where the pressure goes up to two atmospheric pressure, double of what we are breathing. You can get home chambers, but there the pressure goes up to 1.3 only. So it is a little better than what we are uh, breathing right now, but not as good as medical hyperbaric. Also, those soft chambers are extremely expensive. And then once your child is finished, there is, you don't have any use for that. But you can give home hyperbaric, but the pressure is much less. It's 1.3, whereas we need between 1.8 to 2. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alok huh? mm -hmm. or Dr. Nandini, uh, the ozone therapies and the HBOT, HBOT therapies, that is hyperbaric uh, mm -hmm. therapies, they make a lot of sense to me as a parent because I've gone through that. Can you explain to us or to parents more about the regenerative medicine or the cellular therapy and how is it effective to autism and other neurological disorders like cerebral palsy or stroke or any other neurological disorder? So basically, the human brain is the only organ which on its own does not regenerate. What do I mean? Suppose your skin is cut. 
A doctor can take a stitch and your skin joints. If your intestines are damaged, you can cut it and stitch it. You can stitch the heart, the kidney. You can, sti you can fix a bone. But in the brain, you cannot take a stitch. You cannot, you, you cannot suture it. So all these years, for the last 150 years of modern medicine, it was believed that the brain is incapable of regeneration. Because till then, we had only two kinds of treatments. Either we had medicines, like a drug or an injection or a tablet, or we had surgery, where we went inside, cut, chopped, sutured, and closed. There is no medicine and there is no surgery for autism. However, the last 25 years has seen the evolution of a new kind of treatment, which is not a drug, which is not a surgery. It's called cellular therapy, where you use healthy, good cells to repair damaged cells. For example, if you know the, suppose you get a cut on your hand, what happens? That wound heals by itself, right? That wounding is called biological healing. So now it is possible to repair damage in the brain through cellular therapy. So where do we get this from? What we do, the, there are two kinds of cellular therapy. One is when you take from the child's body or from the patient itself and put it back in the patient. And the second is when you take it from a donor. So there are two completely different types. Now, the treatment that we do, we take from the patient or from the child. And what we do is, just above the hip bone, there is something called the pelvic bone, where we put a needle. And we take out the liquid in the needle that is called bone marrow. It's a very simple process. It takes 15 minutes. Uh, the child is given local anesthesia and sedation, so the child experiences no discomfort. Once we take out this bone marrow, we na next take this to our laboratory. And from this bone marrow, we sort of filter it and separate it by putting it in machines called centrifuges. And then we isolate or separate the cells that we need that are in general referred to stem cells what we do is we use what is called mononuclear cells. So we have taken out, I'll repeat again, we have taken out, we've done a bone marrow, 15 minute, just like how you collect blood, right? You put a needle into the, your vein and collect blood. Likewise, we put a needle into the bone and collect bone marrow. It's just a collection. We have taken this to our laboratory. Now we've separated the stem cells. And then once the stem cells are ready, this takes about three hours. Then we call the child back to the operation theater and we, we make a needle puncture in the lower back. Why the lower back? Because in the back, our spine has got a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid, which circulates from the back all the way to the brain. So it goes to the brain, comes down. It's a continuous circulation between the back and the brain. So when we inject the cells into the lower back, into the fluid, within minutes, it goes up to the brain. Once it goes up to the brain, the damaged areas, they pull the stem cells towards it. And once the cells are taken towards it, they start the repair process. Stem cells are known to multiply, they divide, and they convert into neural cells. And we have done all this, we, you know, between 1998 to 2008, for 10 years, we did work in the laboratory, and we worked with animals. And we sh first showed and proved that these stem cells can convert into neuron cells and that they can repair the damage. So in this whole treatment, if you can see, there are only two needle pricks. With one needle, we take out, okay, then we separate the cells, and then with a simple needle, we inject it back. And what are we injecting back in the child? The child's own good and healthy cells. There is nothing from the outside. There is no chemical, there is no uh, any artificial thing. There's no, no donor cells. So you're, we are taking good healthy cells from the child, putting it back into an area where it is needed. So it's a very simple process. Did you understand the process? I can repeat it. A simple needle into the pelvic bone, take out the bone marrow, takes about 15 minutes. Take the bone marrow liquid, take it to the laboratory, filter it, separate the stem cells, and then call the child back and inject with a very thin needle into the lower back spiny fluid from where it travels to the brain. So the beauty of this treatment is it is so simple. It can be done anywhere. It's not, it's not complicated. It's not like the major, you know, I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon. I do brain tumor surgery, spine surgery. That's also complicated. 
takes hours and hours, you go and open the skull, go into the brain, do things, it's nothing like that. Two needle pricks is all it requires. And we are using our own good cells and putting it back in the child. So we now have a clinical experience of all more than 13,000 patients. Uh, people from all across the world, more than 100 countries actually, from 102 countries have come to us. And several patients from Tanzania, several patients from Africa. Uh, and with this treatment, we are able to repair the damage and we have proved it in two, three ways. One, after the treatment, the child starts improving by itself. You know, the understanding improves, the comprehension improves, the behavior improves, the eye contact improves, they get back their speech. Several of our children are able to go to schools. Uh, you know, many of the kids we have, we have treated several years ago, they have not only gone to regular schools, but they've graduated. Many of them are now doing jobs. Uh, you know, so they become completely independent. So our kids, in a few years' time, go off the spectrum. Why? Because now we've repaired the basic damage in the brain. Once the brain damage is repaired, now they are able to integrate and get into a normal life. So that is broadly what stem cells do. Did good. I try to make it as simple as I can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Alok, for the detailed um, explanation. But I'm sure uh, many parents here will be wondering, because we've heard a lot of things about stem cell therapy. How safe is it, and are there any risks behind it? So that's the most wonderful thing about the treatment. It is 100% safe. You know, why? Because we are not operating. We are doing just two needle pricks. With one needle we are taking out, with one needle we are putting back, and we are using the child's own natural healthy cells and putting it back. So there is no danger or no risk. Now the only possible risk, and we have published this as well, is in children who have epilepsy. Epilepsy is convulsions, you may be aware, where there is a past history of epilepsy, in 3%, it's a small ratio, but it's 3% of the children can develop epilepsy after the treatment. Uh, but if it does happen, it is treated with medicines and it can be controlled. This risk is not there in children who don't have epilepsy. So in children who have epilepsy, there is this 3% uh, possibility. Otherwise, it's a completely safe treatment. We have a zero risk of infection. We have no patient so far who's become worse than what they were before. As, as a parent, your main issue will be, my child should not become worse than what he is. So about that, I give you an absolute guarantee. And they're very strong words. A, a guarantee that a child will not become worse than what he is. He will not lose any skill that he already has. He's only going to improve. Uh, my question following that, again, thanks, Sarah, for that excellent question. I think that puts a bit of anxiety is a bit down. But uh, in what age groups do you get the best results? Or well, who is the youngest patient? What's the age of the youngest patient you've developed with, uh, you, you've dealt with? But also I want to know what age groups we should be targeting to make sure we maximize the benefits of stem cell. That's a very, very good question. So what our research finds is that when we treat children below five, they have the best possible results. Now here, there's something very interesting. You know, from, uh, we have a doctor from Kenya, from Nairobi. Uh, he's a pediatrician, and what he does is the moment the patients are diagnosed, at two years, okay, he sends all the patients to us for treatment at two years. And we will be able to reverse the autism in all of them because they've come to us very early. What our own research shows is that the earlier you treat, the better it is. Now, the thing about autism is you don't make a diagnosis till about one and a half, two years. So our youngest child is 18 months. We have several children we've treated at two years, two and a half, three years. We've also got children we've older we've treated, between five, 10. The oldest I've treated is a 38-year-old boy. So uh, now there is a wide range. But like in any other, you take any other disorder, any other uh, any other, what we, we don't consider autism a disease, by the way, so I don't want to compare it, but any other disorder, the earlier you treat, the better it is. Okay, if you have diabetes and you start exercising and shift your diet, you can cure it without tablets or, or insulin. But if you, st if, you, if you start treating it late, then you need insulin, all right? 
the same thing is true of all diseases the earlier you treat the better results you get and here is the problem everybody keeps saying to wait you know that wait 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 till this treatment is more established but the longer you wait the lesser results you get and the results of this doctor this wonderful gentleman doctor from nairobi uh, has clearly shown and he's actually analyzed the data you send children at 2 years and you can almost completely reverse the autism thank you let me ask you, you're talking about a doctor from Nairobi who sends patients as young as they are two years yeah. old. Why is it that we go to some clinics or some therapy institutions and we, are not, we, are, we find that stem cell is not recommended? Okay, that's a very interesting question. See, I'll tell you, and I say this openly, I don't mind saying it, all of us in Asia and Africa have what I call a colonial hangover. They're very strong words. What do I mean by that? When a doctor from the Western countries, from America, England, with a tag from Harvard, Oxford, Stanford comes, all Asian and African doctors start believing in them. All right? But when work comes from Asia and Africa, we don't believe in our own people. Now, stem cell therapy has evolved in the East. So India, China, Korea, and Japan. We are the leaders, okay? Uh, Japan and China have, Japan has al almost 900 stem cell clinics. China has over a thousand. So these are, I'll repeat again, India, China, Korea, Japan. The Western, the, in this particular thing, so the world's first scientific paper on cell therapy and autism was published by us from India. The second paper came from China. The third paper came from uh, Italy and Ukraine. And the fourth and fifth paper came from America. This is a race that India and China have the gold and the silver. The Americans don't even have the bronze. They are fourth and fifth. I mean, I'm just in a lighter way. So our own doctors don't believe in it because they say, why is it not coming from the West? Okay. So th this is the fundamental problem, is because this is an Eastern-driven technology for various reasons. There are political reasons. There are religious. There are several reasons due to which it didn't develop in the West. It developed more in the East. But now, the West is trying to catch up. So in America now, at various universities, like the Duke University and several other centers, they've now started doing it. But they are 15 years behind us, 15 years. So uh, once now they start doing it, trust me, your own doctors will start recommending. Once the results start coming from America, <laughs> they will start believing it. There are a couple of other reasons as well. One of them is that, a lot of developments in the medical world are driven by the pharma industry, big pharma. We know that. We saw what happened in COVID. It was, you know, the, the big vaccine companies and all of that. Now, the treatment we do is not supported by big pharma because they have nothing to gain. In fact, they believe they have everything to lose. So the CEO of one of the biggest multinational companies told me, Dr. Sharma, you are an existential threat to us. I said, why are you saying that? He said, if you make everybody okay, who will take our medicines? Do you understand? Right now, children with autism have to take a lifetime of drugs. A lifetime of drugs for hyperactivity, for you know, so many issues. When we treat them, they stop taking the drugs. So do you think the pharma industry is going to back us? They will not. Like the words you use, it's an existential threat. Right? So I'm not saying they're actively opposing it. And, and sometimes they do actively oppose it. They do a lot of things. But it doesn't have the support. You know. So in various medical conferences and things, if the, the pharma companies are backing it, they, they won't even permit lectures on stem cell therapy. So these are a couple of the reasons. One, it's East-driven, and second, it doesn't have backing from uh, big pharma. Did that make sense? <laughs> Thank you so much. And again, following that, the big pharma. I've heard that uh, the US uh, Food and Drug Authority has not yet approved uh, stem cell therapy. Oh. Is that so? And what have oh, you that's done very about interesting. It? Because, like I told you, uh, stem cell therapy has got autologous as well as things which are manufactured by companies and sold as donor. In August of 2022, a district court in the United States passed a beautiful judgment which actually said that when you take from the patient and put it back in the patient, you do not require FDA approval because FDA is Food and Drug Administration 
and when you take from a patient put it in a patient it's not a food it's not a drug it's a procedure so a federal court in the united states told the fda that you have no jurisdiction over procedures so now the whole question it's not us fda approved is a irrelevant question i'll give you another example it's like the difference between you take an orange and make homemade orange juice or you make canned juice tropicana or whatever you get here okay now to sell tropicana you need permission right you can't go through without but to make homemade orange juice you don't need permission right? do you need permission to make homemade orange juice so when you take from the patient put it back in the patient our indian courts have said that in indian in 2019 our indian high court said that only for stem cell derived products when you're using you need a license that's the words were stem cell therapies permitted and a recent court judgment um, because there there are people who oppose this work just one month ago they actually specified for autism and the high court of delhi and the chief justice gave this uh, judgment said that this treatment cannot be discontinued okay and actually spoke of patient rights so in india fortunately our government has made this distinction very clearly the equivalent of our fda has said very clearly if a company manufactures and sells something to doctors that is a product it requires a license like you require a license to sell canned orange juice our government says if you're a doctor doing it in the hospital you do not require to take permission because it's a procedure uh, procedures don't have an approval pathway a product has an approval pathway there are two separate things a product and a procedure so this is something which the indian courts the indian government has said for a long time now the american court has also said the same thing <coughs> it is here that national leadership makes a big role for example our honorable prime minister sri narendra modi ji <coughs> he is a big supporter of stem cell therapy when he became prime minister in you know in his first address to parliament as you know as to what his government will do they included five areas where they will focus on research and one of them was stem cell therapy the other was nanotechnology thorium research but one of them was stem cell therapy when he went to japan honorable prime minister sri narendra modi took time off and went to the stem cell laboratory of professor yamanaka who won the nobel prize for his stem cell work <coughs> we are very fortunate and blessed that the honorable prime minister sri narendra modi ji has written a personal introduction for a book that we have authored there's a book that myself and dr nandri have uh, authored on a disease called muscular dystrophy and sri narendra modi ji has written an introduction for that book so what happens is when you have the national leadership on top supporting something it gives courage <coughs> to the doctors to go ahead and practice it uh, you know the honorable health minister Mullen was asking what needs to be done before the equipment okay before the infrastructure the government has to make policies and rules and we'll share with you some of uh, you know the the there which are there from from our country so that other doctors have become comfortable in doing this then there is of course need for awareness then of course there is infrastructure and then there's training and like i said training is something we offer at no cost at all to different we we already do it you know we already do it for people from different parts of the world uh, another thing since we mentioned our prime minister shri narendra modi ji he did something very very interesting <coughs> there was a word for disability in in our indian language that was viklang which translated meant disabled unable to do it is a negative term viklang means you cannot do somebody who cannot do things and he officially changed the the local word for disability from viklang to divyang which means specially gifted so officially in india now you cannot use the word viklang which had been used for the last 100 years you have to say divyang which means specially gifted now in this one simple change of words the honorable prime minister has shifted the focus to what these children can do and not what they can't do now this is so important because this change in mindset and this comes from the top when it comes from the top it percolates down it gives inspiration and motivation for people to get into the field it it, it gives inspiration for people to set up rehabilitation centers it gives motivation to set up special schools because the rate at which this autism is increasing we will we will have 
you know, like it was mentioned in, I think, Sana, you mentioned in your talk, you know, the most accurate figures for autism come from America, from the US CDC, which says that one out of 36 children have it. Last year, it was one out of 44. And before that, it was one out of 53 or something. And before that, one out of 66. So if you read, and, and, it, and these are not our figures, the US CDC's figures. The graph is going up like this over the last 10 years. By this ratio, next year it will be 1 in 15. And the year after that, it may be 1 in 5. These are the most accurate figures in the world. We are not aware of it. There is a, you can, I don't know what to call it, a pandemic, endemic what, of, of children suffering with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. That will hit us so badly because we do not have the infrastructure for it. And here, governments have a role to play. So again, one more thing, since I keep talking of our Honorable Prime Minister, uh, and this is something I'll share with you, you should uh, please study this bill. He passed a law called Rights of Persons with Disability Act in 2016. It's a wonderful bill in that he's listed 21 disabilities and has clearly, by law, by an act of parliament, give, mentioned a whole lot of privileges and rights that parents have. For example, one problem we must have faced is normal schools do not take your children for education. Is that correct? Yes. I'm sure any, all of you have experienced that. You go to a normal school, they say, we will not take this child. By law, our Honorable Prime Minister said, no school can refuse a child with autism. It is the responsibility of the school to arrange shadow teachers or other special. So all schools by law now have, they cannot say no. So again, all this comes top down, right? We, we can work and we can work in the environment, we can put in hard work, we can slog, we can do everything. But once you know that your government, you know, has, has their hand above you, then we can, we can go the extra mile, we can do whatever else, and there will be opposition. The work we do has a lot of opposition, a lot of critics, a lot of vested interests have tried to shut us down, you know. They've made all attempts to shut us down, but again, at the higher level, when you have a support, you keep going on. So, oh, that's a long question to a short answer. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, again, I am representing parents, the majority of the parents, but I also happen to be a professional. I have two questions. Mm. One is one is to the government. Mm. I think most of in East Africa, maybe I would speak for East Africa that I know most, we do not know the magnitude. We do not know how many people are living with autism because we haven't done the researches that document those figures. It's only a few of us that can come out and say we have children living with autism, but we do not know how many out there they are. We'll need, we'll advocate as parents, we'll come to you and knock at your doors. We need to carry out this research to know, because like they said, it's a pandemic, but we don't even know what we are talking about. We need funds, we need a budget aside to get into the nitty gritties and know how many children we are planning for that, have, uh, that are living with autism. That's not a question, it's a plea to the government. My question is, as a mother with a child on the spectrum, I take my child for treatment and the child is, you know, given whatever they are given. But as a mother, I think I'm more autistic than my child. I have the worries because I understand what autism is. And I worry about the future of this child. Do you have anything for us as parents to also manage those symptoms that we display of anxiety, of depression, of hyperactivity? Because when you go to a hospital, I can tell you some of the parents will slap the doctors because they are frustrated and angry. Do you have anything for us or ad any advice for us as parents? That's one question. I'm happy you're clapping for me because it's been a journey. You actually, um, even when you go to church and your child is discriminated, you're angry and frustrated and rude. Then the other is what is my role in all this you're talking about as a parent in the management of this autistic child? Okay, I think that's the single most important question you've asked because you are tell, asking what is the power within parents? What can you do at home? And I think that's an, a very, very important question. So uh, let me start with, you know, there, there could be multiple answers to this, uh, Dr. Alvia. First, you know, I want to appreciate and thank you for quoting this because you are a parent as well as a doctor. That's why I think they've decided to keep you in the middle. You have parents there and doctors here. But uh, I, 
I want to talk about several things. So first thing, there is actually research that has happened in India which has shown that every mother, especially mothers of children with special needs go through depression, anxiety and severe psychological uh, you know, upheavals. Uh, many of them even contemplate suicide. We've had several mothers who've actually not just thought of but attempted suicide and not just once, two or three times. And whereas for others they may not understand, I think as mothers you can understand why a mother would want to commit suicide because she, it's just so difficult to handle. Now the thing about autism is it's called the silent disability because you can't see it. The children look normal. All right, they look normal and so, uh, but looking after them day to day takes a lot of spiritual, emotional, physical courage and efforts. Right from morning, from getting them up to getting their basic toilet and clothing, to feeding them, to taking them to rehabilitation centers, everything is such a challenge. It's not like, you know, you can just walk across. It's like you're walking across with a haversack and two heavy bags. Everything is a challenge. Everything is difficult every single step and I very often say as mothers of kids with special needs you put more emotional and spiritual energy in one day than maybe most of us don't put in a whole year just to see one day through through so yes it takes um, a lot of um, energy devotion and concentration but one of the reasons for that and I'll tell you the reason for that is all of you when you've gone to your therapists and doctors, they've told you that nothing can be done for your child. Haven't you been told that? All the doctors said nothing, you have to live with this. And what can be more depressing, what can create more anxiety or more depression or more fear and anger than being told, here's this lovely, cute, beautiful child you have. The whole world has advanced so much in science and technology, we are sending rockets to the moon and Mars, then why can't my child be helped? Okay, so that is at the bottom of your frustration, anger, hurt and pain. And here I am to give you good news that that's no longer true. Okay, today we have medical science, medical technology that can actually reverse autism. We've treated several thousand children of that. Our work is published in scientific papers. So today there is technology available. It's not available in Africa, but it is available outside and I'm sure soon with the support of the Honorable Minister and other senior people this should be available here as well. So earlier if you were in a dark tunnel with no light at the end now there is light at the end of the tunnel and once there is light at the end of the tunnel a lot of your anxiety and depression goes away because now there is something you can work towards. So that's the first good news that we have to spread the news that autism cannot be treated is of 50-year-old, 75-year-old myth which is no longer true because we have shown, we have proven through having treated thousands of patients and our scientific publications that this is no longer true. Now, a few things I must tell you from uh, what we have learned from, by the way, we learn much more from parents than we, you know, read from any book. So, we've been doing this work for the last 15 years. We have several children who are off the spectrum and this is what we have learned is required from parents. First thing, an unconditional acceptance of your child the way the child is. Okay, what happens is we ourselves start thinking that our child is less than, that there is some, that our child is not adequate, our child is, there's a problem. See, suppose your child had appendicitis or he had a stone or he had some lung problem, would, or, or even if he had a heart problem, would you think your child is less than? No, you would think you're, you have a normal child who has a medical problem yes or no let's your child had a ho hole in the heart you don't think there is a problem with your child you have a normal child who has a hole in the heart okay you fix it but when a child has autism or a child has cerebral palsy we think there's a problem in the child now so that's the first thing you have to change our children are different they are not less than i'm repeating it in reverse our children are not less than they are different. Just like somebody can be tall and somebody can be short, somebody can be fair and somebody can be dark, somebody can have black eyes and somebody can have blue eyes, some people have brains like us and some people have brains like our kids with autism. 
that is the only pro only problem and we that is something which can be fixed so the first thing we have learned is we have to accept our children the way they are i you know in no way be embarrassed or ashamed or look at them as less than be proud of what our children are accomplishing despite their limitations step one step two what we have learned is the importance of family nobody talks about that all right what we have found is when the family works together as a solid unit the children tend to do much better very often what we find is the entire burden comes on to the mothers and here i'd like to address the fathers in the audience if there are any fathers that the father has a very important role to play see majority of kids with autism are boys there's a four to one ratio and as boy you know i i'll address all the fathers when we were small who did we look up to we looked up to our fathers for behavior right the mother was for love affection food and all that we always looked up to our fathers kids with special needs also look up to their fathers but unfortunately fathers have to make a living they have to work they are outside and they are not able to spend enough time what we have found is that when fathers spend time with autism boys the kids recover much more and much faster we have actually found that what it takes an autism father what are to teach it takes the mother four hours to teach the same thing not because the mother is not a good teacher because the children learn faster from their father so we have found that family is the single most important thing and that kids whose families are supportive when they work as a team who wins a cricket match or a football match or a hockey match the better team and the family is also a team and when the family works in sync with the mother doing some things the father doing some things the other brothers and sisters doing others grandparents have a very important role to play in fact we find that children who live with their grandparents tend to do a little better because grandparents are also a big influence our honorable uh, former prime minister grandparents have a very important we've actually found this that kids who stay in joint families with their grandparents tend to do overall better because a, a grandfather's love and a grandmother's love and the teaching is different from i'm not saying it's better or worse it's just different so family as a unit is extremely important you know uh, so i spoke of unconditional acceptance then i spoke of family working as a unit with fathers needing to give time we do everything else you you know you supply your child with all the money and all the uh, you know uh, facilities and you pay for everything but what your child needs is your time if you can just keep two or three hours aside every day for your child your child will do very very well then what we have found is from a medical point of view when if you take a combination of our cell therapy hyperbaric oxygen and rehabilitation we find that this helps in getting the children to a normal life much faster now what is the role of all of this the brain is like a computer a computer has got hardware and a computer has got software cell therapy fixes the hardware only software comes from rehabilitation and software comes from uh, the family because that is what trains the brain so a combination of cell therapy which uh, and oxygen therapy which fixes the hardware of rehabilitation and a good environment at home that fixes the software and our children will be able to recover so this is the next thing the medical treatment then apart from this there is something very special we found we found that almost all these children have some special ability or the other okay uh, but it was not seen till you did cell therapy because now the brain uh, the brain was partially damaged and so you could not see what is special what we have found is once we repair the damage in the brain with our cell therapy now you can start seeing the special abilities and we have kids who've done we have kids who are brilliant in numbers there are kids who are you know running at the age of 11 running chemical factories uh, we've got uh, if i tell you some of the things you don't even believe them we have a child who can actually read your mind after a child who after some therapy has improved the point that if you think of a number the child can actually tell you what and they are amazing ability they call savants there are kids who tell you you tell them any date in the future you know five any date you say 23rd july 2030 and they will tell you in an instant what day it is it's wednesday and i don't know if you know but elon musk the world's richest man today had autism you can google him he talks about his autism but this man changed the world albert einstein had autism 
okay but this man and he, he could not read you know he could not speak or read or write for very late in life and then this man changed the world seven of our, several of our tech geniuses they don't have autism but they've had difficulty in studying learning uh, you know like you, bill gates steve jobs they never graduated from college all right but these are people who changed the world leonardo da vinci is believed to have had autism so these are s exceptionally gifted people so the one thing that you have to do see you are talking about bringing your children to normal i am saying once you get they they do exceptional things they do the most brilliant things and that is proven by already look at elon musk he talks about his autism he doesn't hide it he says he had this but he changed the world so we have to change our thinking instead of looking at what they can't do we have to look at what is special about them like what our honorable prime minister said by changing the name he said don't look at what they can't do look at what what is the special gift in them so uh, with with this combination of things like i said unconditional acceptance the family working as a unit uh, the medically a combination of you know cell therapy hyperbaric along with rehabilitation and rehabilitation like dr nandini said needs to be comprehensive you need to be able to do all the rehab you can't just do one people think they go to just one speciality and my child will be okay no you need all the specialities together comprehensive rehab and then our children will be able to come out so uh, i hope that answered your question <laughs> yes so maybe uh, wow this is like a ray of new hope yeah. uh, i'm sure all the parents here uh, some of them who might have lost hope mm. but with everything that you have explained uh, it's actually truly inspirational mm. so my question is you have you have spoken about stem cell therapy yeah. And I'm sure in the minds of many parents, they are wondering, wow, it's expensive going to India. Yeah. Before even you think about how much the, the, co the, the operation costs, uh, you think about even the air ticket and the flight and accommodation and everything. So is there any plan to bring this in Africa? Yes, yeah, so we are very clear. We want to have a facility set up in Africa, and we are actually keen on so we have actually shortlisted between tanzania and kenya only because they are english speaking direct connection to india so to give you a background for example the government of the bahamas actually invited us and gave us permission to start this and we've just been there recently and in six months we are going to open a full-fledged facility in the bahamas this is to cater to it the, the facility will be in nassau in their capital and there we have government permission uh, just like again we have uh, a former prime minister with us there we have a former prime minister working with us and we have government permission because we have government permission we are setting up a facility there we are very keen on making something available in Africa itself and we would like to have it in uh, Eastern Africa simply because of our closer cultural connections easy uh, you know short distance of travel direct flights and all that and we have people like you you know to, you know mothers like you who would back it up so yes we want to bring this to africa but it's not easy it will require you know permission right from the top from governments it will require infrastructure it requires resources but this is something which you as people because the most powerful voice on the planet is that of a mother is that of parents when you speak out honorable ministers prime ministers and presidents have to listen because we are you know we all democracies you know they they represent us so your voice is what is important not us you know we've come we've shared our information we can share our technology but your voice is what is important you have to ask for it you have to show uh, you know show what's happening right now there are so many people going from africa outside for the treatment it's high time africa had its own stem cell facility which would not be just for tanzania or for kenya or wherever but for the whole continent so people would not have to travel long distances so we are very keen we are willing to partner but this is something which you people have to take the initiative. You know, you have to, eventually it's all about people. It's your voice. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, mothers, you've heard, we have a great voice. Let's get together and advocate for this. Fathers, please support us. Don't abandon <laughs> us. Be with us. This is a journey that we have to walk together. And there is hope that we can say bye to autism but only if we put in our every energy to support these children, seek the available treatment options, I think we can say bye to autism for the most part. 
Uh, thank you so much, our able doctors. I think you've given us a lot of hope. You've explained a lot. You've allayed our anxieties. I think now it's on us to follow what you've no. told us. Thank the you parents. so much, Dr. Avalia. Thank you so much. You know, I really appreciate the fact we have three mothers from three East African countries. Yeah. You know, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda on this platform. So I think you represent all the mothers, not just of East Africa, but of all of Africa, all right? And uh, if you take the initiative, trust me, believe me, the power of your voice is a force of nature. It cannot be ignored, okay? And a mother's voice does something. It reaches out to people. It touches people. And we've actually seen that in our country as well. When we had, you know, different situations, when we had mothers speak up, you know, everybody heard them, okay? More than doctors speaking or hospitals speaking. So I just want you to know the power that you have within the same power and energy that you've used to Im bring about improvements in your kids, you know, that could now be extended to all the kids of the continent. So it's been a real pleasure. And uh, Dr. Nandi, are you okay? Sorry, you want to continue? You no, I just want to say thank you to the mothers. They've done a great job to represent all of us. Thank you, mothers. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. That, that was good. Before you go, you've done a great job. Thank you so much. I know there's a lot of people who wants to ask questions, but because of time, yes, there's a lot of hands. Um, because of time, I would like, because our minister, our deputy minister has a question, so can we please take the mic to him? At least we answer questions from him, and then we'll see if we have more time to invite more questions. Now I'm coffee, tea, and for that. I, I don't think it is a question, it's just a good news perhaps. Uh, I just, he said, I know Professor, he said about the petty CT scan, if we have in the country. Yes, we have. It is in Ocean Road, okay. our good. Cancer Institute. So actually last month they completed it to... Uh, to, to to connect it so that it can start function. We expect this month it's starting to work. Very good. Yes, so we have that. So it's a good news to the parents when we are talking about petty CT scan now we have in the country. Uh, another thing is hyperbaric oxygen machine, you said. Yes, we have it in Muimbili. Yes, in two weeks it will start functioning. So. <laughs> Uh, so we are working with the professor so that you can see, so that it can accommodate everything you want. You, you were saying if it can accommodate everything, but if not, we can make sure that it will accommodate. But we have those two things, then now we remain with the uh, issue of... Uh, yes, we are doing bone marrow transplant. Yeah. Uh, please, perhaps the professor can explain a bit, a bit Thank you, Honorable. So just to add, um, to increase the insight, we are, we are also doing a bone marrow transplantation. Okay, very good. Uh, in one center, we are doing uh, autologous bone marrow transplantation. Okay. In another center, we are doing allogenic mm -hmm. bone marrow transplantation for children with sickle cell. Mm -hmm. So I think that also opens the potential for doing absolutely. stem cell transplant. Absolutely. Yeah. So all the technology is there. We yes. just need to put it together now. You know? That's great. Yes. Wonderful news. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what I'm trying. I just have to say that so that the parents can hear that. Yeah. You talked of many technology, then we can see how is our capacity by now, then we can move from there going forward. But something is going on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, our dear Deputy Minister of Health, for the additions. Uh, and I would like to also, with your, with due respect, call you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, to come on stage and give, uh, give uh, these beautiful people something that we've prepared for them. So please, if you don't mind, kindly come on stage. The panel discussion was great. Thank you so much.
mentioned, my name is Geoffrey Ekongot. I'm the chairman of Autism Society Uganda. It's an honor to be here and uh, to play this role on, on the International Day of the World Disability Day. I now take the honors to welcome Tom Land. But before he wel I welcome him, Tom Land, also known as Thomas Land, was diagnosed with autism at 13 years old. Since accept accepting his diagnosis, Thomas has been recognized as an author, speaker, and emerging leader in the autism community. Tom Land is the world's first Toastmasters accredited speaker with autism. The Toastmasters accredited speaker distinction is reserved for the finest professional speakers in the world who fulfill numerous criteria then compete for the honor in front of a huge live audience. Now, imagine having autism and meeting that challenge because that's exactly what Tom did. Tom is one of only 90 accredited speakers in the world and the only one with autism. He is certified human potential coach and professional diversity and inclusion consultant. He is poised and ready to share his positive energy and inspiring messages as an end keynote speaker, corporate trainer, and consultant to organizations across the country. He also spoke on the TEDx stage to impart wisdom and inspire others with his talk titled, How to Come to Life. He is the author of the award-winning bestseller, Come to Life, Your Guide to Self-Discovery. And recently, published his second book, My Glass is Full, Stories of Putting Mental Health First. He recently set a Guinness World Records record as the world's oldest person with autism to finish a full Ironman triathlon. I once again welcome Tom Land to present his topic, Come to Life, Preparing for the Transition and Your Future. Mr. Tom Land, you're welcome on stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. It's an incredible honor to be in your presence at this conference. And it's actually something I wanted to share. Some, I have a bucket list, 101 things I want to do before I die. And one of them is to give a keynote at an international autism conference. So with this speech, check. <laughs> This is also my first time in Africa, and I've now visited every continent in the world except Antarctica, so if anybody knows how to get down there, see me after the speech. <laughs> I want to break the ice with a quick question. Tanzania or Tanzania? A applause if it's Tanzania. <laughs> Applaud if it's Tanzania. You know, I've heard both pronunciations, but I've always wondered, is there a right or is there not? But even though we have different opinions or perspectives or pronunciations, it's all talking about the same thing. And I want to, to keep that in mind as I go through this presentation with you today. And may it unite us in our work. Next slide, please. So you heard a little bit about my accomplishments and Interestingly enough, I, when I was younger, I didn't talk for about six months. But by the time I started talking again, I could read, I could write, I could spell. I was like a sponge full of water, just ready to be run out. And I was ready to get a whole lot done with my life. And I've gone through a number of trials and tribulations and triumphs. But each of these accomplishments that I have has a deeper, bigger meaning to them. 
and I'll be sharing what those are about. And you may notice at the bottom there that you heard about my Iron Man record. Six weeks ago, I broke my own record. I did another full Iron Man, so I'm a year older, and I'll be putting the Guinness Book of World Records again. And for those of you that don't know what an Iron Man is, it's, I know my metric system, 3.8 kilometers of swimming, 180 kilometers of biking, and 42.2 kilometers of running back to back to back in under 17 hours. No easy task, particularly for someone who is subject to sensory overload and stomach matters. I had to manage all of those elements and I just kept on going and I crossed that finish line. Like, next slide, please. Now for professional keynotes, I know some of you may require objectives, so I want to list them here. And I hope you'll see that what I speak about today can apply to just about anyone particularly as they prepare for what life is. If you go to the next slide, please. I have a meaning of life that I'd like to share with you today, because there have been several individuals with means of life, uh, Monty Python, if you follow that particular comedy series, uh, religious leaders, philosophers. But I find that life is not really a word, but an acronym. One of my many talents is to take words and form them into an acronym, a better way to categorize and memorize information. So I'm sharing my meaning of life with you today. And think of these categories as they pertain to your young person or young people on the autism spectrum or what have you. We have love and relationships, starting with the love for yourself and your relationships with others. We have independent living, and that's not necessarily limited to like being on your own or moving away from home but about making decisions about your life, being in charge of your life so that you take it to where you want it to go. Then there's the F, which stands for further education, not limited to college or a university or a degree or diploma, but keeping an open mind, having awareness of what trends are going on in the world, and also being mindful to what other people have to say. So you have the most information you have to make an informed decision. And finally, the E stands for employment, because particularly when it comes to autism, there are more unemployed or underemployed individuals on the autism spectrum than any other class of disorder. And I think that is something we definitely need to work on putting a dent in, because our young people deserve to find something that they do well and can contribute to society and, if all goes well, make them earn their own money. Next slide, please. Telling you a little bit about my dream, right around the time I got diagnosed, I knew that I loved Star Wars and I was good with numbers and I told my parents, I'm going to be George Lucas's accountant. And I set that into motion. After I told them, my parents about though, they could have said, Tom, that is a pipe dream. You really think you can be George Lucas's accountant? But they didn't kill my dreams. They instead gave me a reality check. You want to be George Lucas' accountant? You have to go to college, you have to pass difficult tests, you have to find work in the entertainment field. He's not going to hire someone right out of high school. And I have a bit of what I like to call a Batman mentality, like where there's a will, there's a way. Even if there's darkness, I'm going to find a way through the light. So I said, challenge accepted. And I went to college and I passed the CPA exam that's a certified public accountant. And well, thank you. <laughs> for those of you that have heard of it, it's probably one of the most difficult tests there is. <laughs> and I worked for Disney straight out of college doing property taxes. And after I left Disney, Disney would go on to acquire Lucasfilm, George Lucas's company. So the way I see it retroactively and indirectly, I was George Lucas's accountant and felt like I'd accomplished my goal. And I had several years as an accountant, worked in a big four accounting firm internship, had some temp jobs, but I finally got something I was striving for. And you might want to write this down for your young people. Please write down permanent, full-time employment with benefits. Permanent, full-time employment with benefits. And if possible, gainful employment so they can make enough money and save for a rainy day. That was something I was striving for my entire career. And I finally got to that level 
working as a CPA in the corporate environment in the private sector. But if you go to the next slide, and I think you may have already seen it, the one with the laptop, it cost my physical, mental, and emotional health to get to that financial level. I dreaded going to a desk, sitting there all day, crunching numbers that would not matter in a few years. At the same time, I also saw and heard stories from my peers crashing and burning in life because they did not know themselves. They did not love themselves and they were not being themselves. So eight years ago, I decided to leave my accounting career behind completely, put in my two weeks notice at work and now I give speeches, I tell stories, I do coaching, I do consulting. So I wanna reach people on a personal level. And yes, let's go to the Toastmasters slide next. Because after I left accounting, I knew I had to better my public speaking. Uh, back about two slides, please. I knew I had to better my public speaking skills. And mind you, we fear dying more than speaking in front of an audience. Wouldn't you agree? You, you, you wouldn't want to be up here right now doing this, would you? Or maybe you would, but I've found that if I can master the art of public speaking, I could probably cheat death, but at the very least, I can tell a story, do something that will resonate with you. So the Toastmasters organization has an accredited speaker program designed for those that have mastered the art of public speaking and apply it to a particular trade or line of work. And for someone on the autism spectrum, which is a social communication disorder, and being able to master the art of public speaking, which is essentially socializing and communicating, I wanted to show myself, my peers, and the world that you too can break barriers. You can overcome obstacles. You can shatter ceilings and stereotypes by showing people that it can be done. So that's, oh, thank you. So that's why I went for the accredited speaker designation. And if you go to the next slide after that about the human potential coach. Right before the pandemic, I got certified as a human potential coach because speeches are one thing, but I wanted to reach people on a personal level and find out what's really going on with them, get to the root of who they are and how they can make the world a better place. And today is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I was at the United Nations four years ago in New York describing why people on the autism spectrum deserve equal employment opportunities. And the United Nations has sustainable development goals that they want to fulfill by the year 2030. And if any of you happen to see my lapel pin here, I have a, a pin with those sustainable development goals illustrated. And if you go to the next slide, I have a long-standing partnership with the Los Angeles Police Department Mental Evaluation Unit because law enforcement, police officers, people that protect our community, our young people are likely going to have an encounter with them. They may not have had one yet, but there's a very good chance that they will. And our officers need to know what to do. So I share my stories and give them pointers on how they can best serve our population. But there's another thing that was overlooked that my mother and I put into play. Next slide, please. And that is to teach our young people what they need to know when it comes to interacting with the police. Because ladies and gentlemen, just training the police is not enough anymore. Our young people need to know how to interact with the police. And this could mean the difference, the knowledge that they get from this movie, Be Safe, which my mother created based on stories from my own experience. Granted, I've never been arrested or imprisoned, but, and I'd like to keep it that way. I've heard stories, and my mother was a consultant for families who unfortunately had a young person who wound up on the wrong side of the law. So I urge you to use Be Safe or similar tools that might be at your disposal to show young people how to interact with the police. That could mean the difference between freedom and imprisonment, or even life and death. Next slide, please. So looking at those life outcomes, the L-I-F-E I brought up earlier, raise your hand if you think our population is having good outcomes based on current circumstances. I'm not seeing many hands out there at all. And that's kind of the point, because if you go to the next slide here, particularly when it comes to becoming an adult 
or accepting a high school diploma. Those seem to be, at least in the United States where I come from, the things that make the services amongst our young people just disappear. They fall off that cliff. They were getting services in school, but once they become a legal adult or get that high school diploma, it's like, you're on your own, goodbye, good luck. And that's not right. Because if anything, autism does not disappear when you turn 18 or get a high school diploma. If anything, adults need more services than most. They need that support. It is a lifelong condition. And we can do better to support our adults as they grow up and walk through life, figure out who they are, what they want to do, and how they can make the world a better place. Next slide, please. So how do we empower individuals with autism and improve those outcomes when it comes to life? And that, that brings us to the next slide, which is a book that I wrote called Come to Life. After I left accounting, my mother and I put our heads together and decided to write a book sharing my secrets to success. Because a lot of times, people are lost when it comes to what's out there for them, or when they turn 18, it's like, now what? And when I started college, I had a huge realization that there were so many choices that had been made for me, like my classes were decided for me. I was now at the point where I had to be the one to make decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, life doesn't come to you. It's up to you to come to life. And that's why I named the book Come to Life. I think too many of our young people are sitting back at home waiting for some kind of miracle to just drop into their lap. You have to be the one to go out there and find what you're looking for. Pursue the success and the life that you crave. Nowadays, those go-getters are being the ones that go out there and make things happen. They are the ones that are taking charge and being the change they want to see in their lives, as Gandhi would say. So I explained to my peers in the chapters of Come to Life, which I'll be going over with you today, how they can be their best selves. Next slide, please. Beginning with chapter one, driving your life forward. Now, mind you, you do not have to know how to drive or operate a vehicle to drive your life forward, wouldn't you agree? As far as where you are in the car of life, if you will, you could be in the driver's seat, you know where you're going, you can get yourself there. Or maybe you're in the passenger side, you have an idea of where you want to go, you're telling someone else to help you get there. Or maybe you're in the back seat of the car. You don't know where you're going, you don't, may not even care where you're going, you're just along for the ride. Raise your hand if you think your young person's in the back seat right now. Okay, we've got a few people, but really what Come to Life is all about is about getting our young people out of the back seat and at least into the front so they have some say in where their life is going. That is the foundation for success. Next slide, please. Now, one of the first questions my mother asked me as we were getting this book together, she asked me, if you could tell your peers one thing, what your secrets to success are, what would it be? And I said, Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. That's a mantra, yes, thank you. That's a mantra that I created and I live by to this day. And something, we have a term in our family called video talk. When I say something I heard in a movie or a TV show, and my mom asked me, was that video talk? Did you hear that from somewhere else? I said, no, that came from up here and in here. And it's what my message is to my peers and I think the world as a whole. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. That sets the tone for what comes next. So as far as driving your life forward, and then we get to the three elements of that mantra. Next slide, please. Starting with knowing yourself. Aristotle said, knowing thyself is the beginning of all wisdom. And this is particularly true when it comes to a diagnosis or a condition you may have. Raise your hand if you have not told your young person about their diagnosis. Really? All of you have told your young person that they have autism and they understand it completely? That's, that's pretty impressive. But in some cultures, they do not t 
tell their child about their diagnosis. There could be many reasons for that. Parents might be in denial. They think it'll crush the kid's spirit or self-esteem. And all too often, that causes the child to become confused because they're going to grow up, possibly sense something is different about them, and they're going to go to their parents looking for answers. What's going to happen then? And if the parent knows about it and doesn't tell the child about it, how's that going to help the relationship or the family dynamics? And also when it comes to knowing yourself, it's also about understanding not just your strengths and what you're good at, but also your, what we call in Toastmasters, opportunities for improvement. And I have my fiance Rosetta here with me. We're both Toastmasters, so we're both all about observing what's good and what can be improved. And the same has to go for our young people. Why? Because if you focus only on what they do well, there's a risk that they make, keep making the same mistakes over and over again. On the flip side, if you only focus on where they fall short, they may never find out where they can truly thrive, what they are really good at, and what they do better than anyone else on the planet. Each and every one of us has something that we do better than anyone else on the planet. So we have to look at both, what you're doing well and where you can improve, and both get addressed. That's how you truly know yourself. And when I was young, I thought I had to know everything, and I, I had to be perfect. I dread even getting like a B on a test. I, want, I would rip it up to shreds. I didn't even want to face the idea that I'm not perfect or I don't know everything. And I was really hard on myself. I thought my mother was perfect, so I thought I had to be perfect. And when I come to find out she's not perfect, and I'm like, well, you don't really talk about your problems a lot. Granted, parents do make mistakes and don't always get it right. But the important thing is, is that we love ourselves. And that is the next slide, the second part of the mantra. Love yourself. It was RuPaul who said, if you can't love yourself, how can you love someone else? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, <laughs> that's more like it. When it comes to your diagnosis, being in denial about it or wishing that things were different, that's just time and energy wasted. And my parents did something for me that really set a tone and made a huge difference in my life. They let me know that they would love me no matter what. I didn't have to change. Yes, thank you. <laughs> because this is the life that is going to be, the question is, how is the family going to go with it? And I should note that, figuratively speaking, when there's one person with autism in the family, the entire family has autism, figuratively speaking. So on that note, are you all going to be on a unified front around your young person or people? Not take no for an answer? Find a way? I think that is needed more and more in this world. And I'm very grateful to have had a supportive and loving family that saw the potential in me, wouldn't stop fighting for me, because it helped me see that I'm worth fighting for and I'm going to start fighting for myself. And I also had to be mindful of who I'm keeping in my life too, because family is with you more or less forever. But when it came to making friends, anybody here ever been told or had someone say to them, I'll be your friend if, or if you do something for me, I'll be your friend. Do you think that's unconditional love or that that's a real friend? And do you think our young people would question that and think something may be up here? So we need to be mindful of the company we keep and also see how we can give back to our community, for, particularly for those that might have difficulty finding and keeping a job community service, volunteering in nonprofit organizations. I did that for a number of years. I still do it to this day, and I make a difference. So being able to give back to your community is another part of loving yourself. And something I had to be mindful of is I grew older and had to weed out those people who maybe not were true friends or wanted me to be something different. 
That brings me to the third part of the mantra, if you go to the next slide, which is be yourself. It was Coco Chanel who said, beauty begins when you decide to be yourself. And this gets a little bit controversial at times because each and every one of you, I imagine, has some kind of idea or vision as to what your young person's life might be like or look like. The question is, is that what the young person wants? Is that being who they truly are? Or is their authenticity being jeopardized a little bit? Because, mind you, I wanted to be an accountant. My family supported that. And everyone seems to have these suggestions about how we can be better people on the autism spectrum. But it kind of begs the question, why not just like us for who we are? Yes, we have the option to hear what you have to say, but it should be our decision on what we do with that information. And if, like me, you understand the value of input and how it can help you become your best self, there's being yourself and there's being your best self. That could make a difference too. And a lot of times, I know when I was younger, I wanted to please others. I wanted to not rock the boat. I would kind of take people at their word or think people had my best interest at hand. I was a little too trusting. And that came back to hurt me a few times. So at the end of the day, I decided I'm going to hear what people have to say, but I have the final decision and they should be willing and able to respect that. Wouldn't you agree? So as we look at our young people and their lives, ask yourself if you're letting them live the life that they want to live. And if they don't know what that is, what kind of life they want to live, maybe they need more guidance on what that is and what kind of options are available to them. Which brings us to the next chapter in Come to Life. Next slide. Finding your niche or niche, depending on your pronunciation preference because a niche is a little hole in the wall where a piece of art or statue fits right in. And each of our young people deserve to find a place where they fit in, where they do well, where they can shine and their talents can be put to good use. Unfortunately, not everyone seems to have all the opportunities to go out there and find out what that niche is. Whether they're staying at home, could be by choice, or not. And even in today's virtual world, sometimes going into a virtual chat room or where the action is, that's part of finding your niche. And also understanding that as we grow older, our niches, our niches, where we fit in, change over time as well. And speaking of change, it's happening all around us. Like, I'm not the same person I was five years ago, five months ago, or even five minutes ago. So the change is happening all around us, and I think there are, there's a lot of resistance to it, or like you want to fight the elements and not want things to change, everything to be constant, predictable, and unchangeable. But ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you the only constant, predictable, unchangeable part of our lives is change? That is what's going to be happening whether you choose to accept it or not. So with that being said, finding a way to let change or make change work in your favor. Find ways to adapt, change, evolve, grow, and see where that can take you. Let's go to the next slide, chapter six. Find your voice. Find your voice and more importantly, use your voice. Wouldn't you agree? You could find your voice, but if you're not using it, not doing its purpose, right? As I mentioned earlier, accepting that you must be the change you want to see in your life. Now, by a show of hands, in meetings such as IEPs that you may have with your, your young person, raise your hand if your young person is not present at these meetings about their future. Okay, so a few of you may not have your young person present at meetings about their future. Well, getting back to that car example, not having them present at the meeting that's like them not even being in the car at all. Wouldn't you agree? It's like taking them, getting them out of the seat that they're in, leaving them on the side of the road, and you driving off without them. And they may or may not have the tools to call an Uber or follow you or catch up and, or call for help. It's like leaving them in the dust. 
And parents, you are your child's voice now. Who's going to be your child's voice after you die? A family member? An elected representative? How about the young person themselves? And I want to really make sure that even those who may not or have difficulty speaking, they can still find a way to communicate. Just because someone isn't speaking doesn't mean they don't have something to say. Do you agree? Let's go to the next slide. Now, when it comes to speaking and reading, my mother wrote a book about reading comprehension called Drawing a Blank. This is available on Amazon, and I want to encourage you to have a look at it as far as in connection with further education, how people on the autism spectrum, while they can read the pages or the words on a page, they may not always know what the words mean or understand how it applies to life in general or maybe a lesson to be taught. So that's something to be mindful about as you look at your children, your young people, looking to read and more importantly, understanding what they read because that is a large part of being a productive member of society and understanding how they can better themselves as a whole. And let's go to the next slide. I'm starting to wrap up a little bit here. But the overall conclusion of Come to Life is I believe each and every one of us can be the hero in our own lives, particularly our young people. They have struggles, they have failures, but there are also successes and triumphs. And isn't that part of what being a hero is about? You fall down, but you find a way to pick, back, pick yourself back up and keep moving forward. I know I had to do that when I was doing the Ironman triathlon, if you go to the next slide. I actually failed finishing an Ironman twice before I finally did cross the finish line for the first time. And I heard the other day that we need to walk the walk more, but I swam the swim, I biked the bike, I ran the run. And I actually want to pose a little bit of a challenge out there. See, I'm going to be 40 years old next Thursday, 40 on the 14th. So if there's someone, it could be in this room, maybe listening live now, or someone who hasn't shown themselves yet, I want to see if there's someone over 40 years old on the autism spectrum that can finish an Ironman and beat my record. So that's my little challenge I want to put out there into the universe. And I'm happy to give you some pointers of what you're in for. But I believe each and every one of us can be more than even we think we are sometimes. Because there were times I wanted to quit that race, but I thought to myself, there's someone who's going to see this finish and is going to put it into their survival guide, and they'll think, Tom went a little bit further, I'm gonna go a little bit further too. <laughs> Next slide, please because that victory awaits you. Yes, times are tough, there are struggles, you may not always get it right the first time, but what are you learning? What are you doing to change the circumstances, make things different or better the next times around? Each and every one of us can do better when we commit ourselves to that perseverance and the change we wanna see. And if you go to the next slide, I encourage you all, to see how Come to Life, it's available on Amazon, can help you come to life physically. Go to where the action is, whether it's in person or online. Come to life mentally. Be able to pick yourself up and keep moving forward, even if you fall multiple times. Come to life emotionally. Take charge of your happiness and well-being rather than leave it in someone else's hands. And come to life spiritually. Not so much in the religious sense, but giving yourself to a cause or an ideal bigger and greater than yourself. That will help make the world a better place. Raise your hand if you want this for your, your young people coming to life, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That's what I like to see, all those hands. So next slide, please. I relisted those objectives for those that were interested in seeing them. And Next slide, revisiting my life definition. I saw in a breakout presentation yesterday, it said, we must not prepare the road for our children, we must prepare our children for the road. 
because I b have a belief that the world is simply too big to change for one person or one small group, but look what we have here. One person, one small group can change the world. So I encourage you to go out there, give yourself to an ideal, put your young ones on the forefront, and let's create wonderful, beautiful lives for them. Next slide, please. So if you like what you saw and heard today, I am available for these engagements, and I'm pleased to report that a copy of Come to Life and My Glass is Full, my current books, went to our honored panelists while the photos are being taken. So I'm hopeful that those seeds will be planted on fertile soil so that that manual, if you will, that prequel to transition, that's why I like to call it Come to Life, a prequel to transition to put our young people on the path to the best life for them. And my fiance and I are actually writing another book. Oh, go back one slide. My fiance and I are writing a book called They Said We Couldn't, So We Did. Making relationships work when the odds are against you because I do believe we have a story to tell. Our struggles, our successes are going to help see that people on the autism spectrum can and do get married and have relationships that last a lifetime. Raise your hand if you want that for your young person. All right, all right, and that brings me to the end of my presentation with the last slide here. Uh, time and protocol permitting, I believe we have time for questions, if anybody has some. Thank you for your attention. No, I answered everything. You guys are good? I, I'm, I'm getting the signal not right now. and I'm kind of hungry. How about all you? I think it's going to be time for lunch. Thank you all so much. You've been a wonderful audience. so much for watching the plenary session of ICANN Tanzania 2023 presented by Autism Connect. So to give you a brief about Autism Connect, Autism Connect is an association of parents and professionals formed to disseminate scientifically validated information about therapies and treatments for autism. To know more about autism, you can log on to our website, which is www.autismconnect.com. After two successful ICANN conferences, the first one being at Dubai and the second one being at Tanzania, we are now coming up with the ICANN conference at Canada, Niagara Falls. To know more about our conferences, you can log on to our website, which is www.icannconferences.com. Thank you so much.